Chers, euh, chers membres, chers, chers participants, merci euh, euh, d'être euh, là. Euh, on va commencer tout de suite les cérémonies d'ouverture officielle de notre belle journée euh, d'aujourd'hui. Euh, je vais passer en premier la parole à notre hôte, à Emmanuel Casarerou, le président de ce musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac, qui nous accueille magnifiquement euh, ce matin. Emmanuel. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à toutes, bonjour à tous. Euh... Madame la Présidente de, de l'ICOM, chère ma chère euh, Emma Nardi, euh, Monsieur le Sénateur des Hauts-de-Seine, merci de votre présence parmi nous, Monsieur le Directeur Général des Patrimoines de l'Architecture, cher Jean-François Hébert, Madame la Directrice de la Culture de l'UNESCO, qui je crois est en, est en ligne et qui nous rejoindra, Madame la Présidente de l'ICOM France, chère Juliette, Raoul Duval, Mesdames, Messieurs, quel plaisir de vous avoir. Soyez les bienvenus au Musée du Quai Branly Jacques Chirac, je suis très heureux de vous recevoir dans ce très beau théâtre, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Ici, les travées vibrent tantôt sous l'émotion de la création, tantôt par la passion des débats. Et parfois, les deux se rejoignent. Je n'exclus pas qu que cela soit le cas aujourd'hui au regard de la qualité et de l'équilibre de notre programme. Nous verrons cela ce soir. Quoi qu'il en soit, et pour en revenir à une expression un peu plus grave, je veux vous dire l'honneur qui est fait au musée du Quai Branly Jacques Chirac de vous accueillir toutes et tous. Sauf erreur de ma part, c'est la première fois que la journée professionnelle de l'ICOM France et son assemblée générale se tiennent dans notre établissement. Merci de votre confiance. Le moment est d'autant plus opportun que le musée du Quai Branly Jacques Chirac est exposé aux enjeux qui secouent aujourd'hui le monde muséal. J'emploie le terme enjeu, j'aurais tout aussi pu en parler de défis, tant je crois que les opportunités sont nombreuses dans ce nouveau monde dont nous parle notre collègue Neil McGregor. Il ne s'agit pas là d'une formule convenue. Nous le constatons quotidiennement à travers les revendications de biens culturels et les questions de restitution, les questions d'appartenance. Inutile de vous dire l'intensité de l'effort qu'a requise la séquence de restitution l'an passé des 26 objets à la République du Bénin. Nous avons travaillé d'arrache-pied avec nos collègues du Bénin plusieurs mois durant. L'effort fut intense en raison de la somme des tâches à accomplir, bien sûr, mais il fut intense aussi parce qu'il nous a fallu reconsidérer les paradigmes muséographiques forts avec lesquels nous travaillons. Nous avons dû réinterroger notre parcours d'exposition permanente qui de fait euh, s'est trouvé euh, bousculé. Il a fallu composer avec de nouveaux espaces de pratique, imaginer de nouveaux outils et de nouveaux gestes. Je pense en particulier euh, euh, au travail des, des régies d'œuvres. Il a fallu imaginer aussi des formes de médiations inédites sur Internet et in situ. C'est notamment ce qui nous a conduit à monter en un temps record une exposition des œuvres euh, restituées. L'exposition qui s'est tenue uh, very, sur le foyer uh, juste derrière uh, moi quickly, uh, pendant une semaine était gratuite et il s'agissait en d'autres termes d'une équation à trois variables inédites. Uh, 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 Aujourd'hui, avec bientôt un an de recul, And quels enseignements peut-on tirer de la séquence eh bien, on constate que le musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac, est beaucoup plus armé conceptuellement, méthodologiquement, pour poursuivre et développer les collaborations avec les pays d'origine de ses collections. Nos relations s'inscrivent dans un cadre de confiance neuf, inédit par de nombreux aspects. Cela est d'une importance décisive pour lancer des projets de coopération internationale ambitieux, comme celui que nous international projects. We're currently working on an ambitious project around the Dakar Djibouti mission, a scientific mission that has crossed Africa from east to west between 1931 and 1933. We haven't been able to draw in the 15 country we wouldn't have been able to draw in the 15 countries that were affected by this mission without our work with Benin previously it shows our will to work hand in hand uh, with equal partners this mission isn't something new uh, we've been working on these issues since the time of independence in our recent review we look back at the questions Uh, that museums have been struggling with since the decolonization. It's a very interesting uh, uh, review and the work of ICOM is highlighted. I want to encourage uh, you to have a look at it. That's the end of the uh, advertising spot. 
We shouldn't be scared by the challenges. We will need to question the social and political demand. We might even need to uh, critique it, but we need to take hold of this issue. Some thing, one of the things that I'm clear about is that the best way to be stable based on our fundamentals is to work with our collections, work with their history. That's where everything comes from. The production of knowledge, what we're going to say about the items, the idea uh, of the exhibition. All of this comes from the ability to look at the history of our uh, collections to make them not a closed space, but a shared space, a, shared, a space where we can bring together museum uh, professionals, the uh, host uh, countries and uh, communities and the public. We are bringing together a number of principles of, that were decided at the ICOM International uh, a conference in Prague this summer, and uh, our pres president of ICOM France will tell us about that. I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to congratulate uh, our new president uh, of ICOM International uh, for your recent election. We've talked about a shared space and shared accomplishments. The issues around this are connected with today's questions. Who do the collections belong to? This question can be seen as a bit of a matrix. There are sorts of, all sorts of questions, technical questions, intellectual questions, very sensitive questions, and obviously legal and political questions. We might conclude uh, that uh, things might belong to the collections. Our sensitivities, our professions belong to the collections. Time is running out, so I'm going to uh, stop there. I want to thank those from uh, ICOM France and uh, from uh, the museum who helped us to prepare this uh, day. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to all the speakers who are going to uh, come and speak to us here today. Thank you to those of you who are uh, here to be uh, part of our discussions. And before I hand over to uh, the Director General of Heritage and Architecture, I would like to congratulate my dear friend uh, Juliet. You're getting ready to hand over the baton as the head of ICOM France. I want to thank you for these six very fruitful and enlightened years of your presidents. I'm, my regrets is that we haven't had more opportunities uh, to spend time together because we are both very busy. I hope we'll have the chance to make up for that because you are going to uh, move on to be uh, the uh, chair of ICOM Europe. So congratulations on this election again. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you all have a very good day here at the Quai Branly Jacques Chirac Museum. Merci beaucoup, Emmanuel. Uh, bonjour Thank à you very much, Emmanuel. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to everybody who has connected online and is watching us on their devices. I don't want to reiterate the different greetings. Emmanuel mentioned all of the key personalities. I wanted to say, however, Emmanuel, how delighted I'm to, I am to be here at the Quai Branly uh, Museum where uh, we have a lot of links in, uh, in common. I remember, I think of Anne-Céline Roland, who's joined your museum. I think there isn't a more appropriate place to host this conference, this day of work and reflection. The Quai Branly uh, Museum is one of the flagships of our National Museum fleet. Uh, it's a museum uh, that was founded by Jacques Chirac and who has uh, which has found its place within the French and European museum landscape. We know that the museum is facing some of the key issues of our time. Uh, Emmanuel highlighted the issue of restitution. Um, and I would like to highlight the contribution that the Quai Branly Museum has made to this uh, debate, firstly through this initiative uh, of restitution in working with Benin and with Senegal, but also uh, something that our various uh, ministries are very attached 
to, which is collaboration with our African friends, our African partners. Uh, the Cape Only Museum went out to meet African colleagues to ensure that true cooperation can be put in place. There are some projects that have been completed, others that are coming. So this place has been a very fruitful uh place and I want to say on the part of the French Ministry of Culture how grateful we are for the commitment of Quai Branly to this type of action. As I was uh, saying, our museums are facing a number of uh, very significant issues today. There's been the COVID crisis. I think we've got through this in not too difficult a way uh, uh, through the support of the oversight bodies, uh, local authorities, or the French state, uh, in the case of national museums, thanks to the visitors as well, and the audiences who maintain their connection with uh, museums, the state provided massive support for some of the big uh, uh, museums that you know, 800 million euros over 2020, 2021 and 2022. It's been a massive level of support because it's enabled uh, our museums to get through uh, this crisis uh, much better than museums in other countries. ICOM has uh, quoted figures saying that 15% uh, of American museums have not reopened after the crisis. Uh, in France, we've avoided bankruptcy. We've kept on uh, the staff. We've uh, not uh, had to uh, face the issue of, of financial viability. We have got through the, the crisis, I think, as well as we possibly could have done, thanks in particular to the museum teams who faced up to the different challenges and all of the changes uh, that the government put in place uh, with lockdowns, partial lockdowns and so on. Uh, but we are through the crisis. I think we need to uh, welcome this. I think that's something that we can be very pleased about, uh, particularly when we see the uh, visitors coming back to uh, museums. Uh, the ministry uh, 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 was forecasting um, uh, visitor numbers of 50% uh, down compared to uh, 2019. I don't know if 2019 is the good, the right benchmark year. Uh, uh, we saw a really massive drop of 72% uh, in uh, 2020. And the year after that, it was 55% uh, drop in visitors' numbers. But this year, we thought it was going to be 50% down, but we saw that there was a new dynamic, a new momentum. And we saw this uh, starting towards the end of uh, 2021, and in the first half of 2022, we saw visitors coming back. We are preparing budgets uh, for 2023. We uh, think that for 2023, we're going to be at 30% uh, at, uh, down on 2019. But actually, the, the final figures for uh, all national uh, museums and monuments will actually only be at 15% down from the 2019 figures. The initial forecast was 50% down, and it's actually only 15%. Um, we are seeing French visitors, French uh, and European uh, visitors. Uh, we're seeing increasing numbers of international visitors, probably with the exception of our Chinese uh, friends who haven't been able to travel that as much. It's very encouraging, and we think that for next year, uh, uh, I'm going to go before Parliament to do that. We think that now, uh, in 2023, we're looking at... 10 or percent down on 2019 uh, figures and that will depend on international uh, travel so the outlook is actually very positive but despite this we're starting to, to look ahead because we think that we're going to move from a health crisis to an energy crisis and we know that this will affect our museums uh, energy prices are rising and that is a real concern for all museums some people thought that we would uh, 
solve this problem by closing museums, but the Ministry of the Culture is obviously not in favour of closing museums. We need to do everything that we can do in order to uh, maintain museums and keep them open. Because I'm talking about energy, uh, uh, I'm going to talk further about that and talk about the ecological transition. Our Prime Minister Elizabeth Bonn uh, talked about this recently. We are all working, and in particular, I am as a uh, Director General for Heritage and Ar Ar Architecture. Uh, in all the areas that I'm responsible for, we are working to promote this ecological transition to ensure that we get through this energy crisis uh, in the best way possible. Uh, there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot uh, happening in uh, museums, but we're going to need to step up a gear. Since I'm talking about museums, I want to mention that we have a new head of the Museums of France uh, department, Christelle Greff, who was appointed by the Prime Minister today, in fact. Christelle Greff is currently Regional Director for Cultural Affairs in the Eastern Region of France. She is a library uh, con curator. She has run a number of museum projects uh, on the ground and she knows a lot about uh, public possibilities. Uh, policy. So I'm delighted to welcome her to work alongside me uh, to lead a museum's work in France. I'm delighted to be here with ICOM. Um, I uh, want to greet uh, I ICOM uh, International and in particular congratulate Mrs. Nardi on her new uh, role. I'm uh, grateful and pleased about uh, Juliette Raoul Duval's uh, recognition in her new role. It is a great recognition from the international community. I want to highlight the very good relationships that we in the Ministry of Culture have with ICOM. Uh, I don't want to give you all the different examples, uh, lots of collaborations, uh, seats on boards of directors, uh, a number of different forms of exchange. One of the important things that I uh, note is that ICOM was founded 75 years ago with museum professionals like you and I, and we felt that heritage and culture were uh, seeds of peace and that through culture and heritage we could start to improve and build more peaceful uh, relationships between countries. We're seeing that, uh, I was talking about this recently with uh, Juliet uh, uh, talking about the things that ICOM was able to do for Ukraine with trucks of uh, uh, support that was sent over there uh, in order to support Ukrainian museums. Uh, as, a, as a ministry, I hope I'm not giving away any secrets. Uh, I, uh, I believe uh, that I can say that Ju Juliet is hoping to go to Ukraine as, as soon as possible in order to find out about the needs of museums and culture in this country. As I'm very delighted to be here uh, at this event today alongside ICOM. I want to say, and this isn't a joke, I, I, I do read uh, the publications uh, uh, that you have on the entrance hall. They're very short, so they're quite easy to read, but they're very, very interesting. They cover the whole field of museum activities, and it shows that ICOM is at the heart of the uh, thinking. Uh, the Ministry of Culture uh, finds that ICOM is a very uh, a vital partner. We work on public policy. We try to steer and direct public policy in this area. And it's very important that alongside the ministry, there are uh, other networks uh, that uh, bring life to the network of professionals that you represent today. So I want to congratulate you on your work. I would uh, say, in addition, that the theme of collections is a very welcome theme. You flirted with the theme a number of times. It's a very, uh, uh, a very contemporary theme. Uh, Emmanuel has given her point of view. I've got my view as well, but I hope that you will be able to say uh, that collections belong to everyone, but I, mean, I don't want to give the answer before you've uh, started the conference and your studies. But I think that for 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 me and for for the 
ministry that I represent, we, we're we delighted that this new uh, definition of musician, museums has come out in, uh, in, in Prague. And I know that uh, uh, in different languages, the word collections are translated differently. There are sometimes material and immaterial uh, cultural heritage. Uh, but it's really important that collections uh, do remain in museums because I don't know what else there could be in museums. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this uh, conference. It will be very uh, interesting. I'm, I hope that it will generate another book. Yes, I hear it will do. So I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear director, for this incredibly important presentation. I'm now going to hand over to Emma Nardi, uh, president of ICOM International. Good morning, everybody. I am delighted to be here today as president of ICOM International. It's the first time that I'm taking part in this symposium. I'm quite moved by it. And it's incredible that my time as president of ICOM International starts with ICOM France. The first reason for this is that I am Italian, but I have great love and respect for the French culture. So I love Rousseau and the language of Rousseau, who was not French, but who wrote in French, helps me to understand many of the issues of the 18th century. I also believe that the most beautiful language in the world is the language of our roots. It is a marvel to be able to recite some of these verses in our heads. The second reason that I am so delighted to be here with Juliette Raoul Duval is because we have worked together so much. In the moments of distress in 2020, when everything was closed, when uh, we were facing a completely unplanned situation, ICOM launched projects called Projects of Solidarity in order to seek to help and to fight against the lack of hope that we were facing. Juliet was one of the first to understand the importance of these projects and has organized a cycle of online conferences with simultaneous translation, which were incredibly successful and have led to the publication of articles. So her contribution to this time was fundamental. Let's talk about solidarity. We're asking ourselves a question today, and this is linked to sol solidarity. To whom do collections belong? I believe uh, this question is very intelligent. It's not a rhetorical question. Yes, we could say that coll collections belong to everybody, but I do not believe that that is the answer. I do not believe that there's a democratic notion within museums. We need to carry out actions so that collections can be appreciated. I've always worked in the education sector and I believe and I feel very strongly this passion for sharing culture and that is important. People can come into museums but they will not necessarily understand what they are seeing. So this is an important question because it's a policy question. We can, it, it, it opens up different discussions. We can conduct numerous research projects in order to understand this major problem, which is decolonization and restitution. But once again, I do not want to appear negative here, but I believe that the term decolonization is somewhat problematic. We need to find something. We're talking about colonization. We all know what colonization is. And we know who the actors of colonization were. And we know who was subjected 
do colonization. But when we say decolonization, it seems almost as if these same people feel entitled to do something for those who were passive within the colonization process. So we need to find another epistemological possibility to tackle this issue. I do not have the answer, but I think that it is important to understand Eurocentrism and how it has ravaged our minds and spirits. Let me share something with you. Europe created space and time. Space, because we measure from Greenwich, for time, sorry, and for t space, because we measure space using the meter, which is located in SEV. I think that symbolically, it's very important to recognize this. Let me give you a seemingly banal example. In ICOM, there are people taking part from across the world, but we choose time zones that are between three and five in Europe, which means that people in Australia need to wake up at 4 a.m. and people in Asia go to sleep at 1 a.m. Perhaps we need to mix up this conception, even in something seemingly banal, when we set the times of our meetings. We need a paradigm shift, and this is very difficult. As I said, I have soaked up French culture, but I have very little, very few notions of Chinese cultural standards. If we are not aware of that ourselves, ICOM, even ICOM will struggle to meet the expectations people have of it. I'm a president who has come from the bottom. I had a different route than others in the past. I was elected because people wanted a president who welcomed change. But how can we change? I need your help because it is incredibly difficult. It's so difficult to even take into account problems. Sometimes we're not even aware of them. So let's come back to our roots. Museums are incredibly complex cultural objects. We have three different stories, the story of collections, the stories of buildings, and the story of the institution. So, for example, collections. Why are some objects located in some museums and not others? The dream of a universal museum, this universality of museums that Napoleon held so dear does not exist because no museum can be complete in the universal sense of the term. But we need to explain to the public why we have some objects and not others. Why do we have uh, items in Naples, Madrid? This is about a political connection, wars. This means that collections are moved from one part of the world to another. And more recently, we have witnessed the purchase of major industrial, by major industrial players of objects in the US. Our museums in Europe are located in beautiful buildings, sometimes historic buildings. Or in this case, this building was built to spec for this collection. And there's a clear symbol that I can see as somebody from outside France between the Arab Center and the Quai Branly Museum with the same architect working on this. But the public don't necessarily know about these links. I think one activity that we need to carry out is one of education within the museum itself. This is because there are, there are countries that do not have the same resources that we have here. 
and outside of the museum as well, so that we can say that collections only belong to everybody because people can understand them. I know that I have a very large task ahead of me. I have a great board of directors with members from across the globe, with a team at ICOM, with significant expertise. I need your help and I hope that we will all be able to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma, for this presentation of your plans for ICOM. This is the first time that you have been able to express that in your own words and that you have been able to speak to the members here today. We are now going to have our last introductory speech during our opening session. This is a video that Krisha Picat has recorded for us, who is director of emergencies uh, and uh, culture. Dear director of the Musée du Quai Brony, Jacques Chirac, dear president of ICOM International, dear president of ICOM France, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a true pleasure for me to be able to talk to you during this day organized by the International Committee of ICOM France, I would like to thank the President Juliette Raoul Duval. This day is dedicated to thinking about collections and their role in our institutions and the question of to whom they belong. This is an emblematic issue. I would like to thank the Quai Branly Jacques Chirac Museum and uh, the President uh, Emmanuel Gasterero for their welcome. We have the same aspiration and dialogue for intercultural communication. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Emma Nardi for recently being elected to the International ICOM International Council. UNESCO would like to continue the long and fruitful cooperation that it has had with ICOM in support of museums and their collections. And we will also be working to protect and safeguard cultural heritage. The topic that we are talking about today is at the heart of an important debate with questions of identity, memory, sovereignty. These questions are not just legal, they are also diplomatic, political, historical, philosophical, and ethical. What makes a collection? We want to allow members to identify what they mean by collections, but the legal framework with the recommendation of UNESCO from 2015 for the protection and promotion of museums and collections is important. It determines their role in the society and we define them as a series of natural, tangible and intangible goods which are old and contemporary. This definition follows on from what was proposed by the Code of Ethics of ICOM. These are rich with history and multiple geographies. Collections can bear witness to a people, to the history and culture of a country. But more than that, they also bear witness to a common good, the common good of humanity which we need to conserve and pass on to future generations for education, reflection, and sharing. According to a report from 2021 by UNESCO, we believe that there are around 180,000 museums in the world. This shows the importance that states give to the protection and promotion of heritage in all of its components. 
Museums and professionals play a central role, not just in the acquisition of collections, but also in their interpretation, research, education, and communication. The social function is essential in order to ensure the cohesion of our societies. Collections and the museums that house them are therefore interdependent. This is why since its creation, UNESCO has supported member states in developing their museum policies and work to support museums, especially during crises, by training staff and museum institu institutions through experience sharing and capacity building. Cultural objects move around, and this is due to history, trade, conflict, sales, but also illegal trafficking. The question of to whom they belong is essential, and this seems to be increasingly important in 2022. The legal framework and national and international guidelines exist in order to help us in this question. And this is what we will be hearing about this morning. But we can see that, yes, the legal framework provides protection, but sometimes this can go against the work that we need for research. Anyone from civil society who are sometimes demanding a different belonging and they, their voices have become increasingly heard in recent years. The, 20, the restitution of 26 uh, cultural objects to Benin, organized about a year ago, is one of the most significant examples of this. There are restitutions to Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and this demonstrates a new process in place and a new conception of whom collections belong to and the need to contextualize them. UNESCO has implemented reference legal framework in order to support member states in restituting cultural goods. The Convention on the Measures has been thought about in order to prevent the import, export and transfer of property illegally. This is from the 1970 law in UNESCO, which sets out rules governing restitution of cultural goods and promotes greater collaboration between the states on this matter. As heard, cultural goods are one of the fundamental aspects in identi identity. They can only be appreciated with, in the light of the complete information given about their origin and their history. Preservation of cultural assets within their origin, original context is very important and UNESCO is working towards this in a partnership with its partners such as ICOM. The Intergovernmental Committee of UNESCO for the return of cultural assets to their original country was created in 1978 to create a platform of exchange between experts in order to discuss the issue of the return or restitution of cultural assets. I am sure that today's discussion will show a number of different perspectives and give different reflections on the role of collections about the restitution of cultural assets, which may lead to a new dynamic in the future in support of collections and museums. 
Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you an excellent day of discussion. Thank you very much. The opening ceremony has now come to a close. We are now going to move on to the next stage of our work. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, Jean-François, Eman Hardy, Christa Picat, for everything that you said and this introduction that places us at the center of our discussion today. And I think you've already seen how important this is. In a few moments, we will be welcoming Christopher Pomiana for our keynote lecture. We are all very keen to be hearing from Christopher Pomiana. I would like to, however, say a few words. Uh, I would like to start by thanking you, dear ICOM members and participants, for being here with us this morning, here in the room and online. Dear speakers from France and from four different continents, I would like to express my gratitude for having accepted taking part in this discussion by ICOM France at the Musée du Quai Branly. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Jean-François Hibert. Uh, it's a real honor to have you here with us today. And uh, dear Emma Nardi, the brand new president of ICOM International, thank you so much for traveling to be with us for one of your very first talks. Um, dear uh, Emmanuel Cazarou, uh, March, uh, last March, you accepted uh, that we would be able to host this question here in the museum from, uh, of Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac. Thank you for, um, for this. And we are perhaps somewhat daring and naive to want to address this subject in all its meaning, including restitutions, but not limited to that. We did not set out to be provocative or to generate discord. We suggested that in good faith, we could ask the question of to whom collections belong. There is a real question of to whom collections belong to. We admit that we do not always know to whom an object belongs, uh, where it comes from, who is legitimate to tell the story. In order to do this, we need to work and we need research. We need law, philosophy. What does belonging mean? Uh, Vincent Negri will be talking about that later. We need to talk about semantics. Uh, property, possession, acquisition? Is it enough to acquire an object for it to belong to us? I'm sure that we will not have all of the answers to this, but we need to ask these questions. And to ask the question in a more overall manner, we're not trying to minimize the gravity of some discussions about restitutions or illegal trafficking, but we want to enrich them. We want to ask the question as museum professionals, to whom do collections belong? This is for all collections, whether they're national museums or private collectors, fine arts, ethnography or contemporary art. When Banksy destroyed one of his works a few seconds after the auction, that was the power of the artist over the work of art. All museum fields are concerned here, but let's not hide the fact that in our museum environment, nationally and internationally, the question of the ownership of collections is largely focused on those whom we do not know where they come from. At ICOM, we have spent the last three years rethinking the definition of the museum. And fin final finally, we, we had success, but we cannot forget the debates and the tears that were shed over the one proposed in 2019 in the wake of a report that was not afraid to assert that Western museums were designed only to house their colonial plunder. Uh, this no Nothing in this sentence is wrong, but Christophe uh, will be telling us that it's a little bit more complex than that. So wisely, where the 2019 definition postulated that the future of museums was polyphonic, the one uh, voted on a month ago returned to 
the fundamentals, the result of an ongoing process of consultation so that we can identify what we agree on from one part of the world to the other. We found reconciliation around the idea that collections are at the heart of museums and the job, the task of museums is to preserve and to exhibit these collections. As the G20 meeting on culture in Rome in 2020 stated, museums are one of the most credible institutions. And this appears in the proceedings of this uh, G20 meeting. Visitors trust the story that is told to them. This honors us, this credits us, but it also means that we have this requirement. We are the guarantors of our purpose and research. And this is therefore at the forefront of the mission of museums. This is what the new ICOM definition does. A museum is a permanent nonprofit institution, the service of society dedicated to research, collection, conservation, interpretation and exhibition of tangible and intangible heritage. Let me just read this to the end. Open to the public, accessible and inclusive. It promotes diversity and sustainability. Museums operate and communicate ethically and professionally involving diverse communities. They provide their audiences with diverse experiences of education, entertainment, reflection and knowledge sharing. I think it's important to say that this morning. This was approved by 90%, so this definition can therefore be defined as consensus-based, however, but from one continent to the, of the world to another, from one culture to another, we do not attribute the same role to museums. Reinventing the universal, I borrow the wording from the title of the next exhibition at the Quai Branly Museum, devoted to Leopold de Senghor. We are placing ourselves at the service of communities for others. Different missions are given priority. This is why we have invited professionals from seven different countries in Europe, North and South America and Asia, in order to discuss the status of collections. The role of collections has become an issue. Where do they come from? What do we know about their history? How were they acquired? What legitimacy does the country or the museum, museum or the collector that owns them have to present them? What responsibility does it have towards them? Faced with all these questions, our role as the National Committee of an International Organization at the heart of this debate is to open this up to discussion and to ask us about the way in which different countries approach these questions, the role of legal frameworks and legislation, the role of research, the convictions that people might have, differing convictions, the financial means required to work with the countries of origin and the skills and training required for dialogue to take place. We are not going to be able to do everything today. This is a lot to do, but we want to open up reflection to numerous disciplines and expertise in order to identify the stakes and the responsibilities. We're outlining a new way of exercising museum profession. ICON was created 75 years ago after the war. We've just been reminded of this. And it was created by committed professionals who were convinced that museums could contribute to building lasting peace. Right now on our doorstep, museums and collections are being damaged and targeted by war and gunfire. Precisely, this is because they are essential witnesses of history. So the list, the red list of threatened objects has just been published for Ukraine. You should also know that ICOM's code of ethics is being updated and considerations on war situations are being revised. We will be talking about that on the 3rd of October at 4pm, so you will be able to find information about that on our website. The commitment of European museums to the counterparts in Ukraine is strong, That's that goes without saying, but however, let's not underestimate the fact that many countries point out the solidarity of Europeans when they are affected, but there is pass passiveness when conflicts are far away. Le Monde spoke of the gap that separates the West from the rest of the world. And with regard to reactions of the war, it highlights for the global South an illustration of the double standards that ruin Western credibility. This geopolitical context that's become unfavorable is the one that ICOM Europe, as I become president, will try to reverse. 
we want to talk about the role of Europe within ICOM. 80% of ICOM members are in Europe. I think that a large amount of the budget also comes from Europe. That's important to say. Let me finish with this. There are a lot of you registered today online and on site. This is because of the topic, but I think it's also because of the reputation, the quality and the position of the speakers who have agreed to be with us today. I will thank them throughout the day as they come up on stage. But I would also like to say that this day would not have been able to be held without the museum, the Quai Branly Museum. I would like to thank Anna, Olivier, Jean, Konerski for the organization and for compiling this program. You know that it is incredibly rich. Philippe Charlois works in uh, research and Solène Roland, who is director of uh, Heritage and Collections. And uh, I would also like to thank the entire board of directors, Marie Grasse, Estelle, Florence Lecor, and especially I would uh, like to thank our vice president, Emilie Girard. I would uh, also like to thank uh, and Claude de Maurice, our general delegate, and Philippe as well, working as deputy. I would like to wrap up by thanking the Museum of Cape Branly for welcoming us today. There is going to be a long and dense day of events today. The other side of the Seine, we will be able to visit uh, Paris and uh, have some drinks together. I would now like to welcome uh, Christophe Pommion to the stage with his immense knowledge of the history of museums. I think there is a book that has uh, been released uh, just now this week, and he is accepted to speak to us today. So over to you. I would first of all like to thank the organizers of this uh, conference who have honored me with this invitation to speak to you, to speak to an audience that I would uh, dream of speaking to because of the quality of people here. It's very a real delight for me to be here. I, I feel very honored to, to attend the conference and to be able to speak to you today. I was asked to talk to you about my work on the world history of museums. I will try to do this in, in the short time I have and give you a bit of a bird's eye view of this work and just to trace about the outline of it. Before I start to talk about it, it would be useful to make a few points. Museums, as I studied them, are first of all a collection of objects. It is by nature artificial. Uh, for the moment, uh, this is enough to, to say because it leads to a number of consequences. The history of museums is only a chapter in the history of collections, which are much, uh, have a much longer history. Collecting is a universal uh, uh, impulse throughout the history of Homo sapiens, perhaps even before that, in all human groups, the, starting with hunter-gatherers. We, as soon as we have unequal societies, these inequalities are projected uh, onto objects. The rarest ones uh, are, are, are collected, and those that are those that are furthest away from the, the everyday use uh, are collected. 
collected by those who are the most power. That became more and more blatant with the uh, absolute monarchies. This is a this is a long history, and it has continued in the history of museums because treasures were brought into museums after having gone through tombs, which was where their destination was supposed to be. They weren't supposed to take. Uh, uh, they weren't supposed to, to leave. Uh, tomb raiders and archaeologists were the big suppliers of museums. There are some exceptions, but they are rare. Museums have a form of collection uh, which would have been inconceivable without the role of these raiders and archaeologists. These are collections that were so used to, and we think it's the most uh, uh, highest form of collection. That's a mistake because it's a form of collection that only appeared three times in human history. We uh, discover it in the second century uh, BCE in uh, Imperial China uh, in the Mandarin era. Uh, and the edges of the Roman uh, Empire. But the influences uh, uh, between these two empires are surprising, but the, the, it would appear that some similar effects took place in both. In these societies, the highest strata of society uh, were made up of lineages of people uh, who collected treasures. Uh, they discovered the charms of ancient sculptures and treasures and their exacerbated re rivalry in exercising power was exacerbated in the quest to possess these uh, treasures, which led to personal pleasure and renown, which itself was an instrument for conquering power. We see similar social structures in Italian towns in the 14th and 15th century of the common era, uh, where we saw the second uh, period of collection, or should we say that a reinvention, because the Roman uh, example uh, was read and admired uh, in ancient texts, and it played a key role. The difference, the key difference between treasures and individual collections uh, comes solely from the fact that the uh, first uh, uh, came from the aristocratic role, whereas the second comes from the very uh, personal, and almost pathological links between the collector and the object that they lived with. They, it all came from the desire to acquire and own objects. This desire was uh, behind the uh, very strong desire rivalry to possess the certain objects. Uh, and this uh, led to similar uh, rivalries between cities and then in the end uh, states, and it ended up leading to the creation of museums. Unlike personal collections, museums are public collections in both senses of the world. It belongs to a, a moral, uh, a legal entity rather than a, a physical person who is mortal. It belongs to uh, a, a, the public, um, which has an increasingly restricted definition over time. Unlike treasures, uh, that were displayed in temples, museum collections are disconnected with religious uh, worship, but they're connected with the future of human beings. We could express this differently. We could say that museums are secular public collections destined to an indefinitely distant future for all humanity, but they nonetheless uh, belong to a group which is rival with other groups, and there are questions of uh, security around them. These items enable members of the group to identify themselves and, again, symbolize a desire to own this common asset. The idea of uh, 
Universal Museum uh, is dissociated, dissociated with uh, the issues of time and place that are often bound up with museums. So in the 15th and 16th century, when uh, individual collections became part of the uh, uh, way of life in Italy, then spread across uh, Europe, uh, the idea of museums started around uh, 1520. It came from a, a Roman idea, a pagan idea. Uh, people started to follow natural curiosities uh, around minerals, animals, and so on. They then focused on antiquity, on art, and so on. And museums remained until the end of the uh, 19th century, an Italian phenomenon. At the, at the start of the 18th century, at the end of the long century of Moors religion, this model started to spread through the Christian countries and Latin influenced countries of Europe. At the end of the religious wars, the political and uh, military makeup of the continent had changed. The artistic uh, landscape had changed as well. The Thirty Years' War and the British Revolution uh, led uh, to uh, pillaging and uh, impoverishment of certain states and a redistribution of works of art around Europe. And we can still see the effects of this on our uh, museums, such as the Prado and the Louvre. Uh, none of these museums existed at the time, but royal collections already existed. And that was the, uh, the, the nascent uh, uh, start of the museums. In the Enlightenment, period. Uh, uh, people started to forget the Renaissance initiative of this. And, uh, we, at this time, collections started to become ordered uh, using a methodical approach. And this was the end started to be the beginning of the end of the cabinets of uh, curiosity, even though some of them did survive longer. With this separation, uh, you had on the one hand museums of art and on the other hand museums of natural production. The, the, the first ones uh, moved on to exhibitions whose aim was to delight the eye and the others uh, uh, started to illustrate uh, the natural system, the natural world. This is how natural history museums uh, came about, and they were present in all uh, capitals. Uh, museums of arts flourished in Italy uh, and Germany, but weren't found in London uh, or Madrid. Uh, Paris was one exception uh, with the uh, Palais Royal and some exhibitions in the uh, Palais de Luxembourg. This initiative interests the monarchies and clergy. The M M Louvre Museum uh, was started by the, the clergy and other museums uh, started in provincial towns at the request of uh, local people. Not only did the number of museums increase, but different types of museums appeared. Museums of history, museums of arts and crafts and other such things. The revolutionary armies and Napoleonic ar armies exported this policy into the conquered territories. And this led to organized pillaging on an unprecedented level with items being transferred to France. It also led to the sale of works by ruined uh, owners in France, Italy, and Spain. The Republican and Imperial uh, period around Europe uh, led to a major redistribution of works of art, uh, which uh, benefited France and uh, England. And the effects of this were felt long after the end of hostilities. France uh, has been uh, uh, asked to uh, return some of the conquests of this revolutionary period, but some have remained and some were taken away in their, uh, the, the baggage of the officers who pillaged off for, for their own uh, purposes. And then in the imperial times, the uh, products of pillaging enriched uh, French museums 
like such as Louvre, this pillaging was critiqued right from the uh, outset. We note, in addition, that the restitution uh, that was imposed on France after the Napoleonic times uh, weren't, uh, were not only uh, applied after the Second World War, but it also led to international law on cultural assets. Uh, during this founding period, we should note the fact that uh, public opinion started to accept the idea of museums in all uh, European nations and uh, museums were felt to be indispensable national institutions as important as major education and research centers. These museums were no longer the uh, sphere of the elites. They were relevant to the whole nations. And this is the uh, time that the Prano in Madrid, the National Gallery in London and other museums in Milan and Berlin were founded and other art museums in uh, regional capitals around Western Europe. It also uh, led to the founding of uh, uh, national history uh, museums showing uh, the, the history from the Middle Ages, uh, anchoring the nature of the nation in uh, recent history. In the wake of uh, the museum innovations of the French um, uh, Rev uh, revolution and following on from work by the Danish, there was a broadening of themes in the second half of the 19th century and it is spread from Western Europe to other parts of the world. Before uh, going into the Eurasian continent and crossing the uh, oceans, uh, the museums uh, continue to develop in Western Europe. Up until the First World War, there were some innovations that changed uh, museums, their architecture and their content, the way in which exhibitions were presented and the relationship with the audiences. Before museums crossed over to the USA, the Universal Exhibition in London in the mid 19th century was a turning point for museums and it has left uh, an inheritance for uh, museums. This turned into the Victorian Albert Museum. It renewed all aspects of the way museums worked, but in particular, a focus on welcoming the public. This museum became an example to dozens of museums around the world. And exercised influence on museums in all sorts of thematic areas. After the London Universal Exhibition and the First World War, uh, museums experienced growth, specialization, professionalization, democratization and expansion in all areas. Uh, at the end of this period, there were already thousands of museums around. This uh, led uh, to uh, the arrival of uh, museums in medium-sized, even small towns. There were uh, specialization, different types of museums, uh, which were subdivided into uh, more and more sp specialized examples. The history museums uh, pr uh, uh, can be split down into different uh, types, dynastic museums, military museums, museums of a population, a town, or even a small uh, uh, regional area. There's sometimes even biographical museums in the home of a person who's being uh, commem uh, commemorated. Encyclopedic museums multiplied uh, their different departments into different categories of objects, uh, separating uh, stamps and engravings from uh, paintings and separating out different eras, the Greek or the Roman times. This led to the development of new careers and professions such as conservators and curators who needed to become more and more specialized. They needed to learn uh, to take into account uh, the demands of the public. Uh, the visitors were increasing in number, but were less and less specialized. So they would need brief and understandable explanations. 
it's important to understand that all of these trends move forward in, in a different pace in different museums and towns, but these trends were operating ev everywhere. There is an issue around the uh, globalization and there is an uh, impact on the European civilization, which was becoming increasing secular based on a Christian heritage that was transformed deeply by the Enlightenment period. Uh, following on from revolutionary uh, movements, Europe's moved uh, to into Central Europe at the same time as they got to Russia. But here, museums only uh, increased uh, slowly. Uh, uh, and the impact of the Universal Exhibition, starting with the uh, Universal Exhibition in uh, London. It is true that uh, there are some uh, 18th century museums in Central Europe. Uh, starting from the 1920, there was a first wave of creation of museums uh, around the world, starting in India, South America, and reaching Latin America. In each of these uh, continents, uh, there are very rare examples, but uh, you'd have to wait for another 50 years uh, to see museums multiply, dividing and specializing, in particular in uh, Australian New Zealand and in the Spanish and Portuguese speaking South uh, America. These museums, were, wherever they were located, were placed in in uh, places that Europe had colonized in uh, their institutions developed by Europeans for Europeans uh, because they were founded in newly independent uh, countries. The exception was India, Bengal in particular, where the elites had very quickly accepted the idea of this new type of institution. Uh, museums left the European uh, sphere when it went into the Muslim room in the Ottoman Empire and in Egypt. The museum uh, there targeted a non-European uh, audience, uh, uh, in particular the Turkish Empire and the Egyptian people. Uh, they weren't just uh, focusing on I, items from uh, archaeological searches, but also to Islamic and Coptic art. The adoption of uh, museums by the Ottoman uh, Empire and Egypt uh, was uh, part of the move to modernize the military and educational apparatus. It was a major disruption, but it uh, was seeking to try to spread culture in Japan the adoption of museums took place quicker than elsewhere. Uh, and the treasures of the temples were opened to the public. Uh, it was introduced by uh, high uh, officers of state. Despite the tradition of uh, individual collections in Japan. The traditions were very difficult, uh, different to those in China, just partly because of the uh, difficult history in the 19th century and the desire of its elites to show a, a superior civilization. The first museums were created not by the, uh, muse uh, the Europeans and uh, only after 1911 were the imperial collections starting to be nationalized. Uh, uh, in Japan. Throughout the decades that I've described very quickly, museums uh, started to move into the USA, and this isn't surprising. At first, it was an export from Europe, but from US and independence, there was a specific feature. The American Constitution allowed the federal uh, did not allow the federal state to create museums or cult cultural institutions. It was associations or individuals that needed to do this. Before the uh, War of Independence, uh, there were many people who were creating cabinets of curiosity, which were often referred of uh, museums. Often these died out after a few years because they have lack of funding or were transferred to individuals uh, and became entertainment businesses uh, that tried to make money. Here, 
uh, museums in this period were uh, seen as businesses. There were no uh, very few museums of art. There were just two, in fact. Things started to change when after years of debate, Congress agreed to uh, 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 accept the proposal of a chemist, James Schnitzel, who uh, wanted to create an institution that had to uh, uh, include a museum. There are now uh, 19 museums. Uh, they're all post the Second World War. They're often uh, founded by philanthropists uh, and then were accepted by the, the, the Congress. After the War of Independence, the economic boom, boom in America allowed for the growth of museums with the appearance of uh, museums of art, uh, which uh, grew very quickly. After a century after the War of uh, Independence, uh, uh, the uh, USA was covered with museum, east to west, north to south. There was a large number of innovations, the biggest innovation of which, which had had uh, uh, some uh, antecedents in the uh, UK was the fact of opening the museum to the uh, visitors and the aim of bringing the public in uh, to uh, it educate them about art. They were collaborations with schools. The uh, public were to become familiar with the museum uh, through guided tours. They needed to be display cases, uh, panels to present it. Uh, there needed to be an auditorium, a restaurant, uh, rest areas, a place for children. And these uh, places need to include events, projections and lectures to uh, capture the attention of the media and to let uh, people uh, know that the museum was there as a, uh, uh, an attraction within the city. These things came into Europe towards the end of the 19th century and then were assimilated in Western Europe uh, uh, and elsewhere, particularly after the Second World War. In the meantime, Europe had been uh, turned upside down, ruined by the two world wars. The first war changed the political uh, map of Europe and brought in the Bolsheviks and the Nazis. Nazis and fascists with totalitarian regimes in the Soviet Union and Germany and Italy. Museums served ideology and were used as propaganda tools. Avant-garde art was banned uh, in the Soviet Union as a symptom of imperialist decadence and it was banned in the Third Reich as a form of uh, decadence. Italy was an exception in this respect. Avant-garde arts only survived in democratic countries, firstly in the USA, when, uh, on the other hand, Europe was conquered almost entirely by the Nazis in the middle of the second centuries. So there was a destruction of artworks on an almost industrial level. Uh, this, uh, in particular, it was relevant to uh, Jewish uh, artworks and also works that were found in public archives. So works uh, were pillaged and found in Western occupied countries. Uh, the Soviets uh, followed suit and didn't restitute, uh, return what was taken from the occupied uh, areas. So in this sense, for many museums, the Second World War still hasn't come to an end. After the uh, reconstruction period, which varied in time for certain countries, the museums experienced a boom uh, unlike uh, anything that has been seen since the end of the 19th century. There was a lot of multiplication. Collections increased, uh, the area, service area of museums uh, increased, and number of visitors increased uh, with an uh, increase in transport. This uh, carried on until the COVID period when the business model of uh, museums uh, was significantly challenged by the uh, pandemic. Before I come back to this subject, let me highlight a few notable changes that uh, happened since the end of the Second World War. Uh, 
Uh, firstly, the shift of the uh, center of gravity of museums towards the 20th century with the history of uh, concentration chants, uh, the Holocaust, uh, there was a focus on science and technology and museums of art. These are the uh, museums that still draw in the public with uh, history and the uh, most dynamic uh, uh, aspects are modern and contemporary arts. We are also seeing a transformation or even disappearance of, muse uh, of ethnographic museums. We're seeing museums of natural history and eco museums, museums of specific identity that are developing. We saw uh, the uh, democratization, not only of the public, but of the museum collections themselves. The, uh, uh, often certain types of objects were felt to be worthy of being placed in museums, but now all types of uh, objects are now fit for collections. There's been a lot of changes to the way museums are designed, the scenography, which uh, these days very uh, far and uh, removed from the classical model of a temple. So uh, there's been a lot of change of museums and then COVID happened. Its effects of museums were assessed by three ICOM reports summarized in a, a, a text by the Intellectual Property Organization. I won't mention them, but I will um, mention the key conclusion of this report. Even though the pandemic uh, closed down rapidly, things won't come back to the situation that was known before, not only because uh, one uh, tenth of uh, museums uh, have uh, uh, closed uh, down and won't reopen and luckily this doesn't affect France as we heard earlier but there have been changes in public habits the document uh, that I mentioned highlights the development of uh, digitalized collections and the present presentation of uh, collections uh, online and the increase in virtual museum visits which uh, uh, were supposed to compensate for the impossibility of visiting museum. On the one hand, we should be pleased with this, but we uh, wonder whether uh, the public realizes the difference between the perception of object on the screen, even if it's a 3D image, or the uh, perception of visiting this uh, object close up. And this is a particularly important difference when it comes to works of art. One should uh, also wonder whether uh, people watching musician uh, items from their own comfort of their own home, whether they will go back to museums when this becomes possible. Digitalization and online pre pre presentation has some benefits, but there might be some negative sides as well. Even if the pandemic is just a parenthesis that has closed, uh, the future of museums is not quite as rosy as perhaps it seemed five or ten years ago for two reasons. The first is because of climate change, and this has already been uh, mentioned, and the increasing energy prices. Uh, energy sobriety may well uh, be imposed on cultural institution. We saw this with the decision of the mayor of Strasbourg to close its city's uh, museums. I fear that this might only be the start. When uh, savings need to be made, uh, what will uh, happen when we face with climate uh, disasters uh, that will strike? The ideological uh, conjuncture is not necessarily favorable to museums. It might even be described as being host hostile. The future of uh, museums requires that the people of the future will have the similar uh, taste, similar curiosity to ours, that they want to look at what we want to look at, that be interested in the things that we uh, are interested in. That has been the case over six centuries, more than six centuries, but will it be the same uh, in uh, years to come? With the uh, ecological ideology, uh, that is coming in and the focus of people on ac human activities that are destroying the, the, the planet. 
what uh, future should we think at? Uh, if our future is focusing on a struggle for survival, the outlook uh, in this sense, uh, would it leave space for the existence of museums? I'm gonna leave you with that question. And I want to thank you once again for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for your very informative presentation. I think that all museum professionals should uh, read your immense work on uh, museums. So allow me to remind you that you will be able to purchase this book at the bookshop. Uh, and I know that it is sometimes difficult to organize your schedule so thank you so much for taking the time out to giving to give us the uh, wisdom that you have just shared with us I really do think that this was a very strong start to the day. We're now going to start our first round table, and I'm going to ask Ella Tribune to come up to the stage. Clerc Chastelier, Frédéric Pech, and Maria Leonora Perez Ramirez from Germany. And we're going to be connecting in with Marie-Sophie de Klippel from Belgium, Linda Knowles from uh, Linda Knowles, sorry, from uh, America, and uh, then we have a pre-recorded video from Inkyung Shang, who is director of the Iron Museum. I would just like to check that uh, Marie-Sophie and Linda's collection has been properly set up. We are already running a little behind the schedule, but I would just like to give you some information before we move on to the heart of our discussion of this morning. Our discussions throughout the day are recorded. Catherine Schwartz and uh, Mr. Fluo are taking notes as well. And Marie-Sophie as well is on the screen. You will see her later. The talks are recorded and this will be broadcast on YouTube live, I think, and then it will be on our website. There will also be a later text publication so let me tell you once again that the day is translated into the three official languages, English, French, and Spanish. The interpreters are working remotely on Zoom, so there may be a few communication difficulties between questions from the audience here. Erika de Vichere will step in in that case in order to interpret any questions asked in French in the room. I wanted to say one final thing. We are going to be together until 12.45 at the latest for our first roundtable session. After that, there will be lunch in the lobby room just behind us. You can access that from the top of the room and we will be back at 2 p.m. on the dot to resume our work. Our day will wrap up with the General Assembly of ICOM France at 5.15 p.m., after which any of you are, who are able will be able to visit the Albert's collection 
and uh, we will be heading off at around 7pm. I'm now going to hand over to Claire Chastanier, who is going to continue this uh, debate. So in 2022, this is a vital issue. This is also the anniversary year of the museum's law in France, and there is an ad hoc law for the restitution of a number of major objects uh, to Benin. So this is why we wanted to talk about the importance of this law. This is very international. We have German colleagues sitting next to me, Belgians, three different continents, seven different nationalities in order to present their respective legal frameworks. I have mentioned the French Act. And uh, we also having uh, we have some journalists here today. So I think you all know uh, Claire Chastanier. She is from the Ministry of Culture from the French Museum Service in France and is deputy to the Deputy Director of Collections. No one would doubt your knowledge of the French legal framework. You are currently focusing on the matter of the circulation of cultural assets, the fight against trafficking, the matter of restitution and uh, the protection of national treasures and the art market. Claire, I'm going to hand over to you now for your first, this first speech. Thank you very much, Juliette, for the honor of handing the floor over to me. And uh, I work very closely with uh, ICOM France's actions as a representative of uh, the French Ministry of Culture. Thank you to the Quai Branly Museum. It's very difficult to speak after uh, Christophe Pognon, and it is going to focus on a much less deep aspects than he talked about. I'm going to be talking about the French legal framework, which does have some unique features, even though there are similarities with other countries, particularly with our neighbors, particularly Belgium, with whom, uh, for whom we will be having a presentation as well. France has a unique legal framework because it is very centralized, which is a marker of how our country was historically built. This centralization in recent decades has undergone change, particularly with modifications and decentralization, which have uh, begun to shake up this centralization a little bit, but it is still quite significant. It is also important to remind you that this is founded on revolutionary principles. This was a very contrasting period, particularly for heritage. There were a lot of paradoxes. We saw the emergence of the role of museums, the notion of heritage and the creation of some of our major national museums. But at the same time, there was vandalism. As Gregory Edwards says, the creation of national collections, but also revolutionary ideals, which mean that we are still seeking uh, to uh, refurnish the Chateau of Versailles after furniture was stolen during the revolution. The majority of collections became public and so they belong to the nation. This does not protect us from any claims or requests for restitution. But in any case, the state is the guardian of that on behalf of the country, and they need to ensure long-term protection. So to answer the general director of heritage, collections do belong to all of us, but there is a matter of appropriation, true ownership. And this is obviously very important, as MNRD was saying. The state is responsible for the law, for the constitution, and most of these aspects are from the government and parliamentary 
acts which are applied uniformly across the national territory, which does not mean that there are not adaptations overseas, for instance, in our overseas territories, but this is different to Belgium and to Germany. And this is a strong marker of how we do things in France. Another important characteristic deeply rooted in the way we work is the public and consolidated nature of our collections. The legal construction of museums began in the 14th and 15th century, and we wanted to separate clearly between the royal family and the state. This was um, implemented very quickly and early to ensure that the king did not have uh, any ownership rights over fixed assets, but only the right of use. So this was to protect the political domain. The matter of public domain, domain on um, collections and movable assets uh, was revised in the 19th and 20th century with a revision in the start of the 21st century with two legal texts that I will need to cite, the law on French museums, as Juliette said, which is 20 years old now. It was released in January 2002, and then also the code for the CG3P, the code for public property from 2006, this uh, is about the public domain and movable assets. So the movable public domain is governed by three aspects um, that represents the, the pillar, the inalienability, the imprescriptibility, and the inseizability. So inalienability is that the public domain, the Inseizable ability, sorry, is about that the, a judge cannot uh, command uh, that any assets are seized. And this means that creditors are not able to seize any assets in return for payment. There is also a matter that concerns um, public. Uh, Parties are not being able to uh, claim a property regardless of the age of uh, the public property. So there are actions put in place to ensure that claims are made uh, for a certain way with this uh, prerogative, which may appear somewhat exorbitant. It is subject to criminal sanctions if um, in the event of a non, um, this is imprescriptible, in the event of a non, uh, of a per public person refusing to recognize the ownership of another public person. The most well known of these pillars is the inalienability. This was established in the Middle Ages with the separation between the state and the monarchy. This is a fundamental principle which will continue to generate debate, I believe. This is because there are very opposing opinions that continue to be developed around the issue of inalienability. And this was reinforced by the law of uh, Museum of France and the Code on Heritage, L311-1, and periodically this comes back up and we need to be constantly and actively wary of seeing inalienability as less. The risk is not that it may disappear, but some, the risk that we have 
when talking about the ownership of collections is that there may be a creation of a sort of sub category within the public domain with assets that are more easily alienable that would not benefit from this protection. So these three principles of the public domain have uh, never received constitutional backing. So there is no constitutional value within these principles. This opens up the path for a legislative derogation, which I will come back to, but constitutional case study does give protection to the public domain to the same extent as um, as public property. Public property is a sacred right and it can only be denied if legally required under and subject to an indemnity. So our legislation is offers a lot of different protections, but we are able to remove items from the public domain through declassification, first of all. So this has been solidified gradually. It can only be implemented where then is a loss of public interest. Even though this has been used in the past, this is not necessarily the tool for the restitution of heritage assets as we have seen for the Benin. So there are three steps in this declassification and modifications have also been made. Competency was given to an institution and the, the law on museums of France. Then there is the law known as the Maori Heads Law And um, Mr. Sayuri has been a leading figure in this. This extended the system to other heritage sectors by creating the National Scientific Committee for Collections, which was also responsible for making recommendations for declassification. They submitted a report to the French Parliament in 2015 to this end. This step was finished by the ASAP law. This is an acronym, Acceleration and Simplification of Public Action. This replaced the Scientific Committee for National Collections, replacing this by a procedure which required the opinion of the Minister of Culture. And I would like to thank the Senate Ministry of Culture for being here today and thank you that they have not given up in this area. The CSNC has been removed on the wishes of the government, but I thank the Senate for keeping a procedure in place. There was a decree, an application decree from the 23rd of July 2021 for French museums. This means that the application for declassification needs to be validated by a competent committee in acquisition, and this is then presented to the Museum Council. So declassification can only be justified by a loss of public interest. There is also a category of cannot be declassified within uh, French museums. This has been decided on by a consortium and this is for uh, objects belonging to the state or acquired with the support of the state. Looking now at restitution, this is a summary which shows that declassification cannot be used, as I said, for matters of restitution. But this is uh, for assets that have not lost their public interest, so they can only leave the public domain in three different ways. This may change. So the first is uh, through a decision of a court of justice. This is not on the initiative of uh, an owner that submits a claim. 
So this is what we saw for the Derain painting, for instance. The René Gampel, which, which belonged to René Gampel. And there have been a number of cases which have led to this solution. And um, this then removes these items from the public interest in the event of damage. So the second option is cancellation of the acquisition. This was introduced. Uh, through the LCAP law in 2016. This is the Code of Heritage. This means that we are able to better apply the UNESCO Convention of 1970 when we're talking about objects that have been pillaged, for instance, and we only realize this after their acquisition. Finally, the uh, law which may be brought on the initiative of uh, the public owner or parliament in order to issue an, a derogation. This is not written within the heritage code. This is the only way to take an item out of the public domain uh, if uh, there is maximum legal protection on an object and requires to use law in order to uh, be removed from the public domain. So this is the case of objects that have been gifted, for instance. So this was used uh, for the restitution requests, such as the law of 2020, which allowed for the restitution of 20 objects uh, from Benin and uh, one from Senegal, five from Senegal, sorry. So we have used this for human remains before using the 24th December 2020 law for the Bronze of Benin. And finally, in 2022, it was also used for the first time to manage the issue of items within public collections when uh, research into their origins identified the fact that uh, they were anti-Semitic pieces from the Nazi regime. This was the case of these three artworks. The law does allow for a slightly larger scope, but I'm not going to go into greater detail. So discussion on how to manage restitution is continuing, even if these three texts have given us opportunities to develop a kind of doctrine and practice with uh, the request, an official request from a state, a scientific and administrative council in place. We are focusing on the restitution of goods of significant interest without looking at mass restitution, which was um, promoted in the Savoir report. We have talked about uh, this as a gesture of cooperation and friendship, and this requires stronger cooperation heritage, as we heard earlier is to the, the, the public domain and removing items from uh, the public, public domain will be governed, as the President of France has said, by a framework law, um, a legal framework. It's difficult because there are a lot of different differences. There are a lot of different 
issues related to this. Some are from uh, colonial colonial backgrounds. Uh, there are not the same legal obligations in place. Um, so this leads us to believe that we're going to need to have a different treatment for each case to have a case by case basis. Uh, we're talking about framework. We, we will need to establish criteria and this is the diffi difficulty. This is more difficult than an ad hoc law where we concentrate uh, on bringing certain objects out of the public domain. Here, we're going to need to create a framework that would be suited to as many situations as possible as a matter of criteria, which will be the leading principles, which geographies will be covered, what procedures will be used. A lot of reflection is underway in order to create text. And I think that we're going to need to have the active support of Parliament in order to create a satisfactory framework. Let me finish. I'm not going to go into the detail of human remains, but I think the ownership of that is going to be even more complex and will raise more discussion than other types of cultural assets because they do not really have a legal status it's the law of people it's not really an object so it's no longer the law of, of people human law that will apply but it's not really an object either their place in public collections as the judge said and in the public domain is not an obstacle it's not a contradictory to their role in collections but then the civil code says that there may be ownership rights that could be applied to these objects so there is a sort of paradox here let me finish off by the challenges ahead restitution is not the only thing we need to find hybrid solutions Perhaps there needs to be a separate statu status to be able to have shared ownership, for instance. Perhaps there will need to be a protocol in order to share benefits. Is the recognition of the country of origin, but conservation and storage in France? Lots of possibilities exist. There are also private collections I've been talking about public collections, but there are private collections uh, which often feed into our public collections. And there's constitutional protection, which makes them outside of the scope of restitution. And some countries do not like this, as they would also like us to be focusing on restitution within private collections. The problem that we have is that there is a conflict of law. Article, An article in the civil code protects ownership. So it's a little bit more complicated here. Let me give you two examples of two countries who have issued claims. There's an African uh, mask here and a Guatemalan. And the first was a Guatemalan piece and the first was sold. The France has no international obligation but shows restitution because there was real proof uh, of the fact that this statue was illegally trafficked. But within the landscape, there are private collections and uh, ownership that would need to be discussed at a later date. Thank you very much, Claire, for giving us such a comprehensive overview. This really does raise a lot of questions especially with regard to whether or not the law can apply to private collections. This is perhaps something that we'll be able to talk about at the end of the session. I'm now going to hand over to Marie-Sophie, who is connected via video link. Good morning, Marie-Sophie. Uh, you can see them on the screen, I think. I want to... Uh, highlight the fact that for those of you who are listening online, you can ask questions in the, the chat. I can't see uh, who is connected or who is uh, sending chat messages, uh, and we'll include your questions in the discussion part of our session later on. Mary-Sophie uh, Clibel, 
you are from uh, Belgium. You are responsible for research at the University of Saint Louis in Brussels and the Catholic University of uh, Louvain. Your research focuses on the restitution of colonial collections, the legal uh, tra treatment of human remains in the museum, the decolonization of public space, and the uh, notion of collective stakeholders in environment and heritage. You're also a member of the ICOMOS uh, International Scientific uh, Committee. Uh, it's like ICOM, but for sites and monuments as well. And you are responsible for legal, administrative, and financial questions. You are going to discuss the question of who cultural assets from the cultural period belong to. You're going to present to us the the Belgian uh, legal situation, which you describe as pioneering, which is limited nonetheless by the uh, federal structure in Belgium. This law was approved by the Belgian Parliament in 2022. What does it say and what lessons can we learn from this? Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation and thank you for the opportunity to speak alongside a number of key stakeholders. All of the questions that were raised by Mrs. Uh, Castane have also been raised in Belgium. We've tried to find an answer to it. So I'm going to show you our answers. They're not necessarily the most satisfactory. On the uh, screen, uh, you can see an example of a restitution which didn't really take place during the King Philip's trip the Congo. He brought with him a wonderful Kakungu mask, but he didn't actually give it back to Congo uh, because the law was only adopted by the uh, uh, parliament uh, three weeks later on the 30th of June 2022. So the mask is now uh, on an indefinite loan to the Kinshasa uh, Museum. I've got 10 minutes to present you the Belgian case. I want to explain, first of all, that in uh, Belgium, the museums are based uh, on federal structures, and so who do the collections uh, belong to? It depends on what uh, structure they belong to. And then I'm going to talk to you about our new law voted on the 30th of June in 2022 about the restitution of colonial collections. So. Uh, this law has gone through 62 years after the independence of Congo. On this slide, you see the complicated nature of heritage and museums in Belgium. Uh, there's not just a national competence as in uh, France, but there, there are some federal museums which are overseen by federal authorities. Major parts of the colonial collections are in there, but there are also three communities and three regions. The three uh, communities uh, on, on in the first picture uh, of Belgium uh, on the scene are often responsible for museums. So uh, acquisition policies depend on the place that museum is found, whether it's in Flanders in, or in the French speaking um, parts of Brussels or in the German speaking parts. Brussels is another case as well, which is more complicated. So the uh, law on restitution uh, on uh, the next slide is only re relevant to federal collections because the federal state is only uh, relevant for the federal collections and not for all museums. So as you see on the 30th of uh, June, a uh, law was uh, adopted recognizing the alienable character of uh, assets linked to the colonial past and determining a framework for their restitution and return. It has been uh, adopted, but it's not yet been officially published in in the uh, official uh, gazette. This will uh, take place soon when parliamentary work resumes very soon, I hope. On the next slide, I want to tell you about this restitution law. It is a historical law because it is going to, in a general way and not a specific way, uh, uh, provide for restitution, but it has been rather targeted. There was a form of compromise because the scope of application is fairly restrict, uh, restricted and uh, it has a fairly succinct procedural framework. So it requires the conclusion of bilateral agreements with the three uh, former Belgian co colonies, the DRC, uh, Rwanda and Burundi. I'm also going to talk briefly about the alienable character of uh, assets in the public domain. So 
this law is based on bilateral agreements which need to be adopted between Belgium and the three former colonies. So the choice that was made was to use diplomatic channels and to negotiate and make agreements rather than uh, by uh, going to the courts and before the judges. Uh, this is explained by the Belgian legal context, which is fairly similar to France. Uh, Although there will be uh, future legislation about uh, the restitution of colonial uh, heritage, uh, the uh, laws are not uh, necessarily retroactive. They, they can't be backdated and applied to existing collections. So a new framework uh, and diplomatic discussions will uh, be required. So, uh, the choice was made to have a fairly uh, restricted scope. It's going to cover all movable assets in state museum collections. This, the law excludes human remains and archives. There's a brief explanation for this, uh, which is that for these two uh, spheres, human remains and for archives, it would be easier to ensure that restitution takes place between these institutions without uh, negotiations, bilateral agreements. It could be seen as a positive thing because it might enable human remains to be uh, returned to families or communities more directly. Let's hope that it does enable uh, restitution to take place. The second restriction is that it's about the time frame. The law applies only to the Belgian colonial period, which started in 1885 with the Berlin Conference and which came to an end in 1960 for Congo and 1962 for Rwanda and Burundi. There are a few loopholes which might enable objects acquired before uh, 1885, uh, because if you know Belgian uh, colonial history, there was a period of violent conquest before 1885, which might be able to be taken into account, but it's a bit of a complicated question which I won't go into here. The procedure is fairly distinctly uh, described. The bilateral uh, agreement will be required, but there will also need to be a scientific examination. And the law just stops there. Uh, in the uh, draft bill uh, were some things that appear in light blue. Uh, it was filed uh, before uh, Parliament in this sense, but it, didn't, it wasn't adopted in this um, in this sense, uh, the, these aspects were, just, were held to be too uh, specific. Uh, they required a, a committee of experts and di scientific dialogue between the different states. This no longer exists in the law as it was voted. Here's an example of two statues, a Lusinga statue, which was looted by someone called uh, in uh, the 1860s, before the, the colonial uh, period, but which entered the Belgian uh, collections afterwards, which can be uh, considered in uh, this law. Just to tell you a little bit more about the draft bill, because this might inspire some of the bilateral agreements. The idea would that would be an expert committee who would give an opinion on the uh, whether whether the objects can be rest restituted or returned. So uh, there's a study of the provenance of those items. Um, uh, this is a bit of an interesting uh, question because for historians, this doesn't mean the same thing as for museum creators. Uh, so uh, the you need to think about whether the uh, item was illegitimately acquired and uh, some forced uh, process or through violence, in which case it would could be restituted, or if it was legitimately acquired, in which case it would not be uh, subject to restitution. In any case, there could be a derogation. The government uh, could decide that even if an item uh, was legitimately acquired, or if we don't know the provenance, which is often the case, the item could uh, be uh, returned. As I said, the procedure is fairly uh, briefly described. It is nonetheless interesting uh, because it highlights some of the points that Mr. Sassonet high, uh, highlighted. We could split the question down to think, who do the collections uh, belong to? Uh, the, the ownership will be transferred to the uh, original state. 
we the law doesn't provide for the possibility of uh, returning an object to a community or an individual uh, but the actual physical return of the item could be returned later it could continue to be managed by the institution uh, that is uh, currently being managed so that would enable some progress to be made and it would uh, perhaps break through some of the symbolic uh, aspects of the debate and transfer the ownership of the item perhaps before it physically gets transferred i'm going to come back to this question of alienability uh, a new aspect uh, of the uh, law is that it removes uh, the inalienability of public collections for uh, movable items linked to the colonial past of the Belgian state in view of uh, restitution. So previously there was a, a smaller law around public, uh, the public domain, so it gave a particular uh, status. So it enables uh, these items to remain part of the public domain, uh, but it prevents there being an issue around inalienability, which would stop the restitutional return of the items. So in conclusion, this law is currently being uh, adopted and it sets out Belgium as a pioneer in this area. The law chooses a diplomatic, diplomatic and targeted approach. It's not the entire colonial context that's taken into account. Uh, uh, the, uh, the objects from other countries, uh, such as China or New Zealand, aren't taken into account. This is just a framework, and a lot will depend on the uh, conclusion of bilateral agreements and the way in which they are negotiated. What will the balance of power in the negotiations be? There might be some levels of inequality. Uh, it might not lead to the, uh, the joint uh, expert commission that was part of the initial uh, draft text. So the other thing to say is this is only relevant to the federal collection. So what will happen to the rest of the collections in uh, Belgium? In the French uh, community of Belgium, a report was submitted in 2020 by the Belgian Royal Academy on the future of uh, extra European collections with a number of recommendations. And in uh, the Flemish regions, there was a discussion in the parliament where a number of experts were asked what uh, Flemish museums could do uh, with their colonial collections, which uh, smaller in number than the collections in the federal museums. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marie-Sophie. You've given us a lot of information there and uh, a lot of questions as well, uh, which we could uh, think about here. But uh, we're not going to be able to say everything in this context, and I'm sure there will be opportunity to continue the discussion. We can see that European countries are asking the same questions, but sometimes the means to answer the questions are a bit uh, different, perhaps complementary, we could say. Let's continue in the European context. Uh, after our contribution from our two German contexts, we're going to cross the Atlantic and then even go to Asia. But for the moment, let's stay in Europe. And I'm going to hand over first of all to Maria Leonor Perez Ramirez and Friederike Perschel. Uh, you're going to speak as a, as a pair. I imagine both of you will be saying some bits to going to talk about uh, the German uh, contact point for collections from colonial context. So the subject uh, shows the way that you're organizing yourselves with a contact point. So it'll be an interesting thing for us. Maria Leonor, you are a research associate. Uh, you studied at uh, the University of Rosaria in Bogota, Colombia, uh, achieving a Master in World Heritage Studies from the Brandenburg Technische Universität in Cottbus Senfenberg. After a career uh, in Colombia with the Ministry of so Social Affairs and the Colombian Agency of the British Council, you continued working in Germany at the Pergamon Museum and then in the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation before joining the German contact point for con colonial collections. Frederica, you are uh, a lawyer. Uh, having studied uh, law at the University of Constance in the Freie Universität de Berlin uh, and the Centre for Transnational Legal Studies in London, you joined the German contact point for collections from con 
post-colonial context. You have worked as a, a legal advisor within the uh, Foreign Affairs Commission of the German Parliament and the Federal uh, Ministry of Justice. You've also worked for the Higher Regional Court of Berlin and the Brandenburg State Parliament. You're going to talk to us about how this contact point operates. And it's really interesting to uh, think about the role of politics in this debate. Thank you very much. Erika and I are very glad and honored to be here. Um, we are going to talk about the work of the German contact point for, for collections from colonial context, which means that our presentation will be, of course, focused on this, on this issue. I will present uh, in 10 minutes the institutional framework, and my colleague Frederike will then continue um, um, uh, to talk uh, about the, the legal aspects. Uh, maybe if I can have the remote, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll, um, our presentation, of course, will focus on the background tasks and challenges of the contact point. Um, maybe as, um, we will present a brief intro introduction, and then I'll talk about the framework principles for dealing with collections from colonial context, and I'll introduce the work of the German contact point for collections from colonial context and talk about uh, the different projects that we are currently developing, especially in the area of transparency and documentation of collections and, and objects. Uh, and then I'll hand over to, to my colleague Federica to talk about the legal um, aspects regarding return. Uh, maybe as an introduction, I could mention that uh, the topic of you know, working on Germany's colonial pasts and, and, and dealing with uh, collections from colonial context was mentioned in the, in the previous coalition agreement between the CDU, CSU, and SPD. Uh, in the document, it is mentioned that uh, the parties uh, want to increase cultural cooperation with Africa and promote a stronger uh, cultural exchanges, in particular through a reappraisal of colonialism and the construction of museums and cultural institutions in Africa. Um, the coalition agreement also mentions that the basic uh, democratic consensus in Germany, of course, includes dealing with um, German colonial history, and a special focus is given, of course, to the topic of provenance, provenance research, which has already been mentioned in different presentations um, here already in this conference. Um, the framework of this coalition agreement, so to say, this political agreement also led um, the federal government um, and the, the, the federal uh, German states and the municipal, municipal umbrella organizations to agree on the framework principles for dealing with collections from colonial context on the 13th of March of 2019, as, as my colleague uh, Frederica will mention later. This is more like a soft law approach uh, to initially propose a way for, deal, uh, for dealing with this issue. Um, the framework principles um, establish uh, three uh, areas of activity and objectives that are key. And now, for, um, at the political level, at the museum's level, to work on, on collections from, from colonial context, these are transparency and documentation, provenance research, of course, presentation and information, which is um, a key, also a key topic for, for museums and, and collections return, cultural exchange, and cooperation, uh, and international cooperation, which is, of course, a key element when one is dealing with collections from colonial context, and, uh, of course, uh, science, and science and research. Um, the framework principles are our guiding principles at the contact point. They design, the, 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 there is a designation of the historical responsibility in connection with German colonialism. They also mentioned that dealing with uh, Germans, Germany's colonial history is an integral part of the social cu culture of, of remembrance and the basic democratic consensus. Uh, it is also mentioned that um, um, working with uh, collections from colonial context and, and dealing with these collections needs to be done, of course, in close exchange and cooperation with the so-called uh, countries and societies of origin with uh, the aim of partnership-based dialogue, understanding, and of course, reconcil reconciliation, which is key. Uh, and the framework principles also mention um, a commitment to create the conditions for the return of human remains and cultural objects from colonial context, which were appropriated in a way which is no longer um, legally or ethically justifiable. Um, 
within the perspectives and uh, of short and medium term, um, there is um, they mentioned that they will uh, the, the agreeing parties that they would uh, draw a proposal for the establishment and organization of a contact point to provide information and advice um, uh, on collections from colonial contexts that are held in Germany. Um, and this is connected, of course, to um, the prompt processing of requests for returns of objects from colonial contexts, but not only of return, but of access and cooperation. Uh, and of course, this is also uh, the framework principles also mention on the short and, short and medium term a willingness to create the legal conditions to facilitate the return of, acti of artifacts of objects from colonial context. My colleague Federica will, will go in depth on, on this topic. Um, and in order it, regarding the framework, uh, the, so, sorry, the area of activity, transparency and documentation, the framework principles mentioned that in order to uh, facilitate and improve access. Um, the uh, Green Paris will draw a proposal for the establishment of our, our, on, an organization of a contact point, which was established in 2019 um, by the federal government, the, federal, uh, the German federal states and the municipalities in Germany. And we have different tasks um, to inform and guide, in particular individuals in institutions uh, um, and institutions in countries and societies of origin as well in Germany. We have uh, a notice, you know, we've been working for two years and uh, there's a lot of need for information not only from countries and societies of origin but also within Germany on how to deal with this collection and also a willingness to establish, uh, to establish partnerships. We of course have to work with different partners uh, at the political and institutional level to forward requests. Uh, we also have a task, a task regarding establishing contacts abroad uh, for collaboration and for the cooperation on dealing with these collections. We also structure, document, publish, and st uh, statistically evaluate data. On this regard, I can share because the topic of human remains has been already mentioned um, in the different presentations. We are all, uh, currently carrying out a survey uh, on human remains from colonial context. We are working with uh, 34 uh, uh, institutions in Germany, um, mu museums, natural history collections, uh, university collections, in order to um, get more information on, on the holdings, on which human remains uh, and from which countries these institutions have, in order to facilitate politics, you know, decision-making processes on this, on this regard. Uh, and we support the Federation Lender Working Group in defining and implementing the, the framework principles. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll introduce our structure. We have a steering committee uh, and a supervisory body, which is the Federation Lender Working Group. Uh, we work with a consortium, with a consortium uh, from which uh, the Federal Foreign Office and the German Lost Star Foundation and also the municipality umbrella organizations, associations are part and also and, and we are based um, uh, at the cultural foundation of the um, German federal state, uh, states, um, and, and we are co-financed by the lender um, and, the, um, uh, and the federal government, so to say. But the cultural foundation of the German federal states is responsible right now administrati administratively and organizatorily for um, the contact point. Um, as I mentioned before, we've been uh, working mainly on the topic of transparency because without knowing what there is in German museums and collections, of course, we cannot take a decision on, on return and on the other aspects and also on cooperation. So we've been working really hard on, on, on transparency and on supporting also institutions in Germany on, on digitizing and, and making their collections uh, public, um, so to say. And uh, on this regard, um, there was uh, an agreement of a, a so-called three-road strategy on the documentation and digital publication of collections from colonial context held in Germany. It was agreed on the 14th of October 2020. Uh, it was also a decision of the uh, federal government, the German federal states, and the municipalities in Germany. Um, and uh, maybe key statements of, of this three-road strategy or, or the main statement, I would say, is to, um, uh, to achieve the greatest possible degree of transparency um, regarding collections from colonial context, which involves, of course, the documentation uh, and the digital publication of these collections. Um, 
The three road strategy uh, is to be planned and implemented with the help of experts, of course, from the countries and societies of origin, as well as with the diaspora in Germany, and this is a project that uh, the contact point has been supporting actively. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, the three road strategy proposes three roads to work on, on publication and, and digital access. The first one is access that was already, I would say, implemented, which, has, which was the creation of a central access to collections from colonial context, uh, which have been already published digitally. Um, for this uh, road first uh, one, so to say, we work with 25 museums, natural history collections, and uh, university collections in Germany. And we created a portal in which right now more than 6,000 6, objects are, are available and, and, and are public, can be publicly accessed. Uh, we are working now on road, road two, which is transparency, transparency or achieving transparency on the medium and long term, which is the basic and further uh, digitization and digital publication of still unpublished collections from colonial context in a central depository. We are now also working with um, uh, members and experts of the communities and societies and countries of origin on the data standards for the for their publication um, of, of, of this uh, information online, because of course um, this is this is a process that has been mainly decided, so to say, in, in Germany and in Europe. You know, the standards for publishing information, and we cannot uh, think that you know the same standards that we use are the ones that are helpful for people uh, in the countries and societies of origin in order to. Um, to know our other objects and collections, so we are working very closely with, with uh, partners abroad and row three, and this is, I would say, um, something that our museums and, and institutions in Germany have been working on, is cooperation, which is digitization and, and publication uh, based on standards that are developed with uh, the countries and societies of origin, as well as the diaspora in Germany. Um, there is a portal already, as I mentioned, uh, with information on more than uh, 6,600 data sets. Um, and maybe another topic that I would briefly mention here is the statement, um, I mean, our work regarding, the, regarding dealing or the handling of the Benin bronzes in German museums and institutions. I guess this is a topic or, that, you, that you've already um, read about in the news, uh, how actively Germany is, is dealing with uh, uh, the Benin bronzes in German museums and institutions. Uh, there is a statement, uh, a common statement uh, of uh, the 29th of April 2021 uh, of the Ministry of State and Culture and Media um, and the German museums that are um, working or that belong to the Benin Dialogue Group and also uh, they're responsible for cultural affairs uh, ministries of the Lenda and the Foreign Office. I mean, they agreed on three steps for dealing with the Benin bronzes in Germany. The first one was create transparency, and the second one is to hold further ta cooperation uh, with, with Nigeria to decide about uh, return, and of course to determine uh, uh, concrete actions and a timetable for, for the upcoming tax and for, for the return of the Benin bronzes. Uh, within this regard, the task of the German contact point was to publish um, a database of all Benin bronzes that are held in German museums and collections. And um, this is something that we've been working on um, over the past year, I would say, as we receive information, because there are museums that are still working on, on the provenance of these objects. Um, but I think that right now we publish uh, information on around 1,000. Uh, more than 1,100 um, uh, Benin bronzes that are held in, in German uh, museums and collections. And maybe I'll finish my presentation by mentioning that, uh, as you may have read, um, uh, Germany signed a joint declaration for the return of the Benin bronzes, uh, and, 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 and it also involves bilateral museum cooperation between Germany and, and Nigeria. It was signed on the 1st of July of 2022, and both sides emphasized the common understanding uh, and the aim in returning the Benin bronzes un unconditionally to Nigeria, and underlined the potential involved in building further partnerships in, in the area of preservation and digitization of cultural heritage mu um, museums and research cooperation, art exhibitions, and archaeology. It is planned that the first um, Benin bronzes will, will be uh, returned to Nigeria this year. And of course, the different lenders that have museums which hold Benin bronzes in Germany will need to sign 
uh, or to decide on, on, on agreements to be signed with Nigeria to, to allow for the Benin bronzes in, in the different museums in Germany to be returned to Nigeria. So I think that I'll finish my presentation now, or my part of the presentation now, and I'll hand over to you to talk about the legal aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I will just continue where my colleague has left off, and I will use the next 10 minutes of our presentation to say a few words on the conditions of return um, of collections from colonial contexts in Germany. And in the first part of my uh, presentation, I would like to explain the relevance of the framework principles in the German context and will highlight the relevant provisions on return of these collections in the framework principles. And in the second part, I will focus on the relevant provisions in German financial, in the German public financial law that play a role in the deaccessioning of collections from colonial context. And in the third and last part, I would like to give a small outlook on the question what role the law will play in the German context in the future. So my colleague already introduced the framework principles for dealing for collect with collections with, um, from colonial context, but why is this document important? Germany is a federal state that consists of a federation, the Bund, and the 16 states, the Länder, and more than 10,000 municipalities. And in all these three levels of <coughs> governance, there exist public and publicly funded institutions that own collections from colonial context. The framework principles constitute the political agreement between all these relevant actors on the federal, lender, and municipal level. Um, and here you can also see in the table the different um, representatives for the federal level, the lender level, and the municipal level. Um, having said that, I would like to address also some ex restrictions of the framework principles, namely that they are not legally binding and that they do not cover collections from private institutions. The provisions on return and the framework principles define which objects should be returned. This includes, on the one hand, cultural objects from colonial contexts which were appropriated in a way which is no longer legally and or ethically justifiable, and on the other hand, human remains. However, precise provisions on the structure of a return process are not addressed, and the framework principles only contain general rules, like the return requests have to be processed promptly, institutions are, uh, are called upon to take independent and uh, proactive approach, and returns should only be made in agreement with countries and societies of origin. But what are the legal preconditioning, preconditions that are required for returns? The framework principle in particular highlight the financial regulations on the federation, the lender, and municipalities. And in this regard, the framework principles declare that where further legal action is necessary to allow for returns, these actions have to be taken or are taken. So now I will come to the second part of my presentation where I would like to talk about the necessary legal actions that have to do to be taken according to the financial regulations of the Federation, the lender, and the municipalities to make returns possible. In Germany, the competencies in the area of public budgetary law are divided between the respective public territorial authorities, namely the federal state, the 16 lender, and the municipalities. When it comes to the deaccessioning of public property, all provisions in the financial regulations on the different levels have a similar content. In general, all relevant provisions prohibit the deaccessioning of state property when no corresponding equivalent is given in return. That means gifts and disposal of property under value is in general prohibited. The reason for this prohibition is that the reduction of state funds should be prevented and state property should be protected. However, there are um, exceptions to this general rule in all relevant laws. But there has to be made a distinction between the federal and lender level on the one hand and the municipal level on the other hand, which you see in this table. The federal and lender level, the relevant um, financial regulations provide for two possible ways to make exceptions of the general rule that state property cannot be deaccessioned as a gift or undervalue. 
So the general exception, so first, the general exception to the rule of deaccessioning can be added in the annual or biannual budgetary law or budgetary plan of the federation or the lender. This decision has to be taken by the respective parliament and has to be renewed every year or every second year. Second, the financial regulation provided for an, for an additional exception when a particular object is concerned that is either of low or minimal value or of special interest of, for the lender or the, a special interest of the lender or the federal state is concerned. This decision has to be taken by the competent ministry in every single case. The situation is, as I said, is different in the municipalities. There, the financial provisions do not provide for the possibility of a general exception. They only allow for exceptions to the prohibition of deaccessioning under value or as a gift in particular cases under vague requirements, for instance, when the interest of the municipality is concerned. Uh, in general, due to the relevance of the deaccessioning de cases, the elected municipal representation will probably decide. So this means the city council. So what does it, this mean for deaccessioning of uh, collections from colonial contexts? The relevant provisions for deaccessioning of state property also cover cultural property and therefore also collections from colonial contexts are covered, who are owned by, which are owned by the public and publicly funded entities. In some cases, there are also examples for practical measures that have to be taken so there are already, already examples for practical measures that have been taken to allow for the deaccessioning. On the federal level, for example, this year's annual budgetary law contains a general exception to allow for the deaccessioning of cultural property from colonial context, which were appropriated in a way no longer legally or ethically justifiable. So the, the wording of the framework principles. On the lender level, some lender already made similar amendments to their budgetary laws or plan to do so in the future. On the municipal level, some municipalities has, have asked their administrative bodies to prepare decisions of elected municipal representation to de-accession specific objects. This is uh, in particular the case with regard to the Benin branches. S um, so, what does that mean for future developments in Germany regarding the legal framework for the return of collection from colonial context? The current focus of the contact point in legal matters is in this rather complex situation is to offer advice on the one hand to persons from countries and societies of origins with regard to return requests or for German institutions on the federal lender and municipal level for, with regard to the legal requirements of return. Due to the federal system, the current legal structure regarding returns is quite fragmented, and hence the question could be asked in the it could improve the situation. However, the development of a comprehensive legal framework for return requests faces many challenges when it comes to the domestic and the international law. First, in general, the Federation has limited competences due to the independence of the lender in cultural matters and power. Uh, the power to decide on budgetary issues is also limited to the respective territorial entities. Second, the precise definition of concerned obje objects, the context of acquisition or possible claimants might not provide satisfying solution for the multitude of possible contexts and cases. And third, the state-centric thinking in public international law might inhibit the inclusion of civil society actors or representatives of communities in return procedures return procedures or processes. While it is not clear in which direction political actors in Germany want to, t want to go in the future, there are two possible options. So one option is a soft law approach on the, on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, the drafting of restitution laws. But as I said, this is for the political actors to decide um, and for sure, experiences in other countries will be taken into account, and that's where I want to leave, um, uh, leave the, um, want to end our presentation, and I'm looking forward to the discussion.
Merci. Uh, vous aussi, vous nous dites vraiment énormément. Thank you very much. Uh, you have said so much. Uh, we can see that the approaches are very different. You are using terms that we do not use. Uh, the, the notion of deaccession, for instance, you are focusing on political willingness. And I think that this is very important to discuss this. You also mentioned in your presentation a topic that we don't discuss much here, which is the cost of this process. In Germany, very quickly, you used um, you allocated money for research on origin, and you were talking about the budget law. So this is not a free approach, and uh, and and this is a very interesting new approach to the matter. So we've had three presentations from European countries which have methods that are different but very similar questions. So I'm now going to hand over to our colleague from the US, Linda Knowles, who will be giving us an idea of the, the, the sort of uh, conception of co natural collections that there might be elsewhere in the world. And it's not the same, the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, Linda, you are a lawyer, you're in the Denver Museum, and uh, you are very involved in ICOM's work as you are a member of the Permanent Committee for Legal Affairs. Uh, I think it's important that we mention that as we may be asking you questions about that later. You also work with the, the working group for the Ethics Committee of ICOM. You're a former member of the American Association of uh, Indian Affairs and the Committee of National Reparation, and you've written a chapter on a national Legis international legislation in an ICOM publication looking at museums from across the world. We wanted to make sure that this debate was not uh, only going to be looking at uh, colonial contexts. We wanted to look at the very different contexts, the other side of the Atlantic. So you're going to be talking about charity, questions of charity, neutrality and ownership, collections in the United States. You will be talking about things that we do not have a lot. We have a situation here where there's not a ministry of culture and there's no concept of inalienability. So how do you do things? Over to you. Linda, Linda, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. <laughs> Can, can someone please explain to her what is happening? Is it, Linda, is your microphone switched on? I suggest that we seek to solve this problem, that we try to get in touch with Linda. And in the meantime, we are going to launch the video by our Korean colleague, uh, In Kyung Shun, and this will hopefully give us enough time to solve this sound issue. Can I please ask the technical team to now launch In Kyung's presentation, and we will be trying to get in contact with Linda to solve this problem. Thank you very much, ICOM friends, for inviting me to take part in this critical discussion. regarding museum collections. While the first legal framework for Korean museums had been established in 1984, the current act, the Museum and Art Gallery Support Act, was originally 
launched in 1991. Since its enactment, the Act has been through two major revisions in addition to 11 separate minor revisions. The first major amendment in 1999 saw the introduction of the curator system. In 2016, a system for pre-evaluation for establishing governmental museums and art galleries and accreditation was introduced. Article 1 states that the purpose of the Act is to contribute to developing culture, arts, and learning, enhancing the general public's enjoyment of culture, and facilitating lifelong education by providing for matters necessary for the establishment and operation of museums. In Article 2, it is notable that the term museum material is used instead of museum collection. To classify as museum material, they must meet the standards prescribed by presidential decree, quote, material with scientific or artistic value, evidential material, tangible and intangible, of the human race and environment concerning history, archaeology, humanity, folklore, arts, fauna and flora, minerals, science, technology, industries, etc., which has been collected, managed, preserved, surveyed, researched, or exhibited in a museum." End quote. The Act provides a basic framework to establish and register a museum in the governmental system. It clearly states that the museum curators must adhere to the ICOM Code of Ethics and relevant international legal instruments. The Act has helped to almost double the number of institutions classified as museums within Korea. However, much of the focus was on physical requirements of museum facilities. Once a museum has ticked all the boxes and is registered, there is no system to help sustain professional and ethical management. The Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism of Korea initiated a few projects to address these concerns and improve the quality of a museum. In 2015, the National Museum of Korea developed and distributed a cultural heritage standard management system intending to establish a collection database among museums. A total of 334 museums collaborated to share over 2.3 million objects, which are now accessible to the public via an e-museum. Another notable amendment in the Act was the accreditation mandate for national and governmental museums. Among five accreditation evaluation categories, there were also outlined sections for collection management. These included collecting efforts, adequate control of collections, including facility and conservation, and the utilization of collections, which consist of research, and making the subsequent data accessible to the public. Currently, a system for accreditation private museums is under development. This is a brief breakdown of the current legal frameworks and policies regarding Korean museum collections. Thank you for listening. À distance, je remercie notre amie Linda, mais je ne Remotely, I would like to uh, thank our colleague Linda. Um, so we just saw this uh, video here from Asia, from Inkyung uh, Chung. Um, we are now back with Linda. I hope that we have solved uh, the little technical problem, which meant that we can hear you, Linda. Let's try again, shall we? No, we still can't hear you, Linda. Je pense que c'est votre micro. I think that it's perhaps uh, your microphone. Can you hear me, Linda? Je vous entends pas. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Can you hear me, Linda? Yes, apparently people are telling me that you can. Je vais vous faire une proposition en attendant qu'on règle ce problème de son. 
whilst we manage this uh, sound problem, I would like you to please send us uh, to at least to show your PowerPoint. It will be a shame that you're not able to uh, speak around it, but this would be a way of ensuring your participation, at least if you're able to project your PowerPoint presentation. Je sais pas si quelqu'un peut trouver une solution. Could uh, someone uh, please find a solution? We're trying to contact Linda at the moment. On ne vous entend pas, Linda. Linda, we can't hear you. Are we able to show your presentation? Could you please show your presentation? Est-ce que nous on peut? Can we show her presentation? Parce que c'est très intéressant. It's a shame because it's very interesting. On va commencer, voilà. Donc on vous passe, on... quelqu'un dans la salle dit que... So, somebody in the room is saying... Passer des images les unes derrière les autres, ça permettra... That pas it might be possible to show the slides... Oui, j'ai compris. Oui, oui, le problème vient de chez elle, on l'a compris. The problem is in uh, with Linda's microphone. It was working earlier. Do we have her phone number so that we can call her? We are going to show her slides and then we're going to have to start discussion. Please do read this PowerPoint, there's no Department of Culture, there's no concept of inalienability, there's no historic law. As soon as we're able to establish contact with her again, we will do so. Have we resolved this technical issue? No, not yet. Donc on va, on va juste défiler son, son PowerPoint. Ça nous permettra. So we're just going to keep showing the PowerPoint presentation. We have another 20 minutes left. We are going to make the most of this time to have discussion with uh, the room. It is such a shame because the American vision was so interesting. What I thought was interesting was Linda's participation in all of the ethics work within ICOM. And I think that even though American laws do not protect collections, there is an ethics concern within that that's very interesting. We're not able to re-establish the sound yet. So we're just going to give you the opportunity to read this PowerPoint. Je vous propose d'enchaîner, Madame. I believe that Linda has a problem with her microphone. So we are really sorry, and I do thank Linda for taking part in preparing this roundtable session. And this will perhaps leave us with more time for discussion with the room here and to also read any comments coming in on the chat box on Zoom. I have a first question to ask our participants. 
in your presentation, German colleagues, you insisted on the role of politics and policy. I think in our debate in France, we often oppose the professionalism of museums and the requirements of cultural diplomacy. Is the law a response to this? I'm asking you this question, but I'm also asking this uh, question to uh, Marie-Sophie from uh, Belgium and from our, to our German friends as well. Is law a bridge between cultural diplomacy and uh, collections? Yes, I believe that this is a possibility, that it may be a connection. I didn't insist on this matter as having the, the, the parliament in France with the General Assembly and the Senate, Senate and working with the, the commission as well. This can be a means of blocking or accelerating attempts, political attempts that we may consider good or bad. So I would say yes, but cultural diplomacy in the matters that we're talking about today is important, and I think it's managed a little bit differently depending on the countries and uh, the different countries that are represented today. But as I said earlier, there are there are different methods. As you said earlier, there are different methods, but there are a lot of parallels. We need, and we would want, but we also need, and we have the desire to develop cooperation around restitution. We do not want, in, in France in any case, restitution is not an end in itself. That is what the Ministry of Culture affirms. We have alternative uh, potential solutions that we need to explore. It should also be a vector for reinforcing cooperation, heritage cooperation, to bring together the different co cultures together. It shouldn't be a matter of neo-colonialization. Neo, um, Do you want to say something, Marie-Sophie? Yes, so the advantage of this law, as we heard, is that there's a democratic component. Uh, the people have spoken that we, they want to think about that. There's strong legitimacy in order to make progress around this concept. It's not just the government uh, uh, or the, the, the prince. There's a, a framework that's been adopted uh, by a majority of uh, parliamentarians. There was a very large uh, majority in the Belgian federal government. So this consolidates approaches. Using diplomacy is also a legal matter. These objects from colonial collections legally are the property of uh, Belgium, the Belgian state. And then for private collections, there's even greater protection. So we need to work on a basis of negotiation. Allow me to continue then, as I think we can hear Linda now. Okay, let's try for a third time. We hope that this will work this time. It has appeared a little bit complicated. Otherwise, uh, we had Marie-Sophie and I wanted to ask a question to uh, Marie-Sophie. It was written in the chat. Why do we not uh, apply this uh, legal text to all other museums in Belgium? This is because, like in Germany, we heard this for the agreement signed with Nigeria. It's the federal state. Uh, there's a distribution of a jurisdiction here. The federal state is only competent for the collections, the national collections, other public collections in museums in Flanders or Wallonia, for the majority, are under the jurisdiction of the authorities, local authorities themselves. This is like the, the case in Germany. 
but there is the federal drive within this which should help others to uh, to move forward in this field as well it's uh, a long process though but this may have a snowball effect and with regard to private museums such as university museums they are also considering what to do with their colonial collections Thank you very much. I will ask the question about cultural diplomacy again later, but I've heard that Linda is going to be able to speak now. So off you go. Um, so let's try again. Dear Linda, can you hear me? Bravo. Yes, over to you, Linda. Go for it. I'm so sorry for the technology glitch, um, and I don't know if we'll be able to pull up the presentation uh, for this session, um, but what I'll do is, is just give you a brief overview of uh, the law in the United States um, regarding collections and who owns collections. And I'll start with what's called a land acknowledgement. And this is something that is typical in the United States now. It's, it's been fairly recently. And it is a statement that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science respectfully acknowledges that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations. We also acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that compromise what is now called Colorado, but who live in the American Southwest, the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountain region. I don't speak for any indig indigenous communities. I do work at a museum, so that will be my uh, perspective today. And if we could go to the next slide, um, I can talk for a little bit about what the typical American museum is um, and what it isn't. And of course, the one of the uh, characteristics of the United States is how, is how large it is and how many museums it has. So it's very hard to categorize the legal structure of, of all museums in the United States. Many of them are federal, state, or local museums. At the federal level, there may well be some legal restrictions on, on the sale of museum uh, collection items, but by and large, the, the museum world is part of the charitable industry in the United States. And what that means historically is that the, the United States set up a uh, regime where you could create a business that was a charitable business. And as long as you spend your money and your revenue towards that charitable purpose, you receive a tax deduction. So the donors who give collection items receive a tax deduction when they file their tax return, but the museums also receive a tax deduction in the sense that they do not pay any income tax as a corporation. And that's a 30% tax rate um, that is that simply does not apply to charitable institutions. And this includes not only museums, but hospitals, et cetera. So there is, in order to get this particular designation as a charitable institution, you have to form a corporation under the tax code. And the section that you'll hear mentioned is a 501c3 corporation under the IRS tax code. Um, this designation also means that you need to incorporate in a state in the United States. Um, and when you incorporate, you need a board of directors, you need bylaws, and by the tax code, when you file your tax return, which is a form 990, you have to have a board of directors, you have to have bylaws, you need to have a conflict of interest policy and a couple of other things. All form 990s 
for public charitable institutions are available. They are public documents. So you can see how a charitable institution is investing its money, how it's operating, where its um, salaries are being paid and, and a host of other kinds of information. This industry is what essentially replaces a, um, a ministry of culture as far as the federal government is concerned. So there is no actual ministry of culture. There are many cultural organizations at the federal level, but there's no overarching ministry of culture and there's no historical legacy of, of the ownership of collections being transferred from royalty or royal families to the people, quote, the state. There's just no legal history for that in the United States. So it really kind of developed as an industry on its own that was dedicated to charitable purposes, education, science, cultural, et cetera. Um, in the United States, there is, there is, I think historically for that reason, there is no law regarding inalienability. So instead of laws that prevent you from divesting of your collections, what you have are trust principles buried into the charitable laws that basically say you're not operating as a charitable organization if you engage in certain kinds of behavior that go against your mission. So divesting yourself of your collections would basically mean that you lose your 501c3 status as a charitable organization and it will also expose you to liability under trust law with your state attorney general offices. So the tax exemption certificate that you get with this 501c3 is really an existential document for the museum. You're not going to exist without it because you're gonna to have to pay taxes. You won't be accredited by any institution. It's something that if you're not a governmental museum, you really need to have. Uh, again, at the, state, or at the state or the federal level, for instance, with the Smithsonian collections, there is a whole federal statute devoted to that. It's entirely uh, separate and distinct from your run-of-the-mill local museum. A lot of these museums historically, for instance, in Denver, uh, there was a, a gentleman who donated his collection to the city in the 1900s and at the same time um, a charitable institution was formed and the city deeded care and protection and conservation of the assets to the museum and the museum, uh, so the city owns those assets but the museum is charged with their operation and care. Um, so there is this concept then of being able to, to freely convey property in the United States that's really kind of embedded in the DNA that is, I think, kind of different from the history of uh, a lot of your European institutions. But that being said, there is the same intent to operate in a, in a way that maintains a sense of duty to the public and that you are in a trust or fiduciary relationship to the public and that that is necessary to your um, to, to the existence of your museum. So to talk a little bit about ownership and care, a museum will own its collections if it has the provenance for them uh, a lot of times they might be owned by a state or a government entity, and that entity will control your ability to divest yourself of your collections items. A lot of times in the United States, particularly with geological or paleo artifacts, uh, you are acting as a repository for the state or the federal government, which also restricts your ability to sell or uh, deaccession these assets because frankly you don't have ownership. You have possession, but you don't have ownership. Um, in the United States, there is no such thing as a good faith purchaser. So if property is stolen, you have to return it. Um, 
that's true for museums, it's true for everybody. So a lot of times in the United States, what will come up will be, this property was stolen under federal law or state law. And the analysis is simply whether or not it was stolen. And if it was, then it's returned. Um, the big shift in the United States and in the museum community wasn't so much this, is there a law that says we can deaccession? but whether there is a law that says we must deaccession. And I am talking, of course, about NAGPRA because NAGPRA basically said, you have to deaccession. If you are a United States museum and you house the human remains of Native Americans or related sacred objects, you have to return it. So that kind of set a floor, if you will, for ethical behavior from museums as it related to the Native American community. Um, it's not an international law. It's something that's unique to the United States, but it is a human rights law that is applied to museums. So this concept of thinking of collections within the context of human rights law is not unfamiliar to American museums because of NAGPRA. Um, one of the other things that really governs how an American museum operates is, of course, the politics of money. So fundraising never stops. Museums are always out there doing campaigns, asking for money. Um, there's a lot of, of issues regarding who controls content within a museum. And most American mu museums are very, very emphatic that it's not the board of the board of directors of the museum. It is the museum itself that determines the content. This comes up with things like climate change and what have you. Um, you will also get funds from the, from the government occasionally. You will get funds from revenue. And again, that revenue is not taxed as long as the revenue is related <clears throat> to your charitable purpose. And in uh, the Denver area, there is actually a sales tax and cultural, scientific cultural facilities get a certain percentage of that tax. Uh, and that's something that's really important to the cultural uh, entities here in the Denver metro area. But just to sum up briefly, I think we are dealing with many of the same issues that you all are grappling with. Um, we're dealing with a very charged political climate. We are dealing with colonialism and what it be, means. We know that repatriation wasn't in the definition, the new definition of the museum, but I think we're all taking that definition as a starting point for what we might do differently going forward. I think one of the other things uh, for American museums was George Floyd and this issue of racism and institutional racism and how that plays into the ways museums operate. Um, and I think in a lot of cases, it's not so much about the collections per se, is it as it is about the connections to the people who, who created the collection items. And it is building those bridges and building those relationships in a way that enhances both uh, the community that possesses the item and the community that created the item. Um, but these are really difficult, difficult issues. There's an awful lot of talk right now around these issues. And the SAR Savoy report, I would like to think, got a lot of this going in the United States because it was one of the first, <clears throat> first documents that really kind of laid things out that, hey, we really need to think about this stuff um, beyond human remains and think about the nature of, of ownership and what it means to own a collection um, in 2022. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you so much for your patience. I really appreciate it. Merci, uh, Linda. On arrive au bout quasiment. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. We're coming to the end of our session and we do want to take a few questions. I'm delighted that we were able to hear you, Linda. You were saying some things that were very 
interesting and that will have, uh, raise some questions uh, for us in different terms. You don't talk about uh, the legal framework in the same way that we do. Uh, as you said in your uh, talk, uh, you said uh, that in, in some ways in, in alienability is something that, that prevents uh, transfers. I'm not sure we say it's exactly the same thing, but you highlight the fact uh, that the social and political climate is generating some significant pressure in this area. You talked about the dialogue between museums and native communities. Where does this dialogue take place? That's probably the question which might be interesting for us to hear an answer to. We uh, feel like in our European countries that law, the law, the legal framework is imposing uh, this discussion. Do, do you think that this law uh, bridges the uh, responsibility and professionalism of museums and cultural di diplomacy, if that's the word. Uh, we could perhaps take two questions from the, the floor and then we might need to stop. Um, uh, Li Linda or Francesca, would you like to, to answer? Um, I think that in the German case it's a little bit more complicated and I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to say that uh, a law uh, would um, um, represent uh, or would, would be a bridge um, between cultural diplomacy and, and, and collections. I would say in our case, cultural diplomacy is playing a main role, and that's clear, uh, um, for example, in the case of the Benin bronzes. Um, I think that a law uh, in the case of collections from colonial context would be, in the case of Germany, too restrictive. We are not focusing, uh, of course, uh, I mean, we are prioritizing um, objects from, from former German colonies or, or, or from regions uh, that were under former um, German colonial rule, but we are not excluding the other objects that uh, come from different contexts. So in that case, it would be, I would say, a law would be very restrictive and we have to take into account, and I think uh, Frederike mentioned that as well, that uh, um, in Germany, the Länder deal with cultural matters independently. So I think that uh, a step of a law, um, I mean, at least in my personal opinion, um, would be kind of challenging within the German context, but I would, I would highlight in the case of Germany the role of cultural diplomacy and the fact that um, when dealing with collections from colonial context and, and negotiating return and cooperation, cultural diplomacy plays a very important role because cultural diplomacy, of course, not only involves political actors, but involves museums, uh, involves the scientific community in Germany, and involves you know, different actors that maybe when you are um, negotiating a law are not uh, um, implicitly included. And of course, cultural diplomacy in the case of negotiating a possible return leads to um, uh, 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 establishing the, the, the legal framework that is necessary for, for eventually returning an object, as I, men as I mentioned, uh, as it is in the case of the, of the Benin bronzes. But I, I think that cultural diplomacy is playing now a major part uh, in Germany, and uh, of course it is connected to the law, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the law you know, as, as, as the solution to, to breach uh, or to, to close uh, this gap, but I would, I would say cultural diplomacy plays, and right now is playing a, a, a very important role. Maybe you can, you can add to that. Yeah, um, I completely agree with my colleague and I just want to add a few things because um, the law can never be the answer to this really complex process we are facing when it comes to collections from colonial context because there are so many different aspects which have to be taken into account. And there is a position, like we have to hear the position of the museum's professionals, we have to hear the position of the diplomats. And law has, is one part of this whole thing, but it cannot be the only answer. But what, what really resonated with me was the um, um, the point um, my Belgian colleague made that the law has the possibility to um, 
to produce a dem democratic support for certain policies. And the thing is, in Germany, the budgetary laws, which, which are now being amended, they are adopted by parliament. And the, m some decisions for the deaccessioning in the municipalities are adopted by the representative bodies of the different communities. So there we see that obviously this process has a democratic su support in the society. So there the law plays in a way a really important role and the question is if it's really necessary to have a, pro a really comprehensive legal framework. And as my colleague said, it's quite impossible to create something like this which, which would cover all of the collections and we would have the same problems as, um, in, as exist in Belgium. Merci. Je constate en, en tout cas que les réponses ne... Thank you very much. I can see that all of the answers are very thought through and very uh, comprehensive, but are not always the same. I don't know if there are any other questions in the, the, the room, but it highlights to me the fact that ICOM has a role to play in terms of bringing together good practice and sharing good practice from different contexts. And that makes me think that we do play an important role. I think there's probably time for one question from the floor. Uh, not a lot of time because we need to uh, break for lunch. Uh, uh, there will be a small lunch in the in the hall outside. We'll need to be back here at uh, 2 p.m. French time. There is a question. Can you hear me? My name is Magali Dufour. I am from the Natural History uh, Museum in Toulouse. I'm working on a PhD in anthropology. I've got a question about ownership, as we've been talking about this, this morning, uh, and we've heard a bit about the legislative work that has been going on uh, with thoughts that have come from Roman law or German law. It's certainly not a universal approach. I, I can see from the different uh, piece of work uh, that have been uh, taken on, uh, whether there's a consideration of different types of law, such as customary law, such as native law, there are different uh, forms of legal frameworks, which communities might be uh, drawing on in order to make a restitution request from different countries. What is the connection between uh, notions of ownership that exist in different forms of law? Uh, French law doesn't recognize communities, so we can't uh, discuss with communities in a legal framework in some ways. Obviously, all of the processes uh, that have been put in place with respect to restitution uh, prior to the adoption of the law have uh, set in place a dialogue. But as I said earlier, the request that we uh, receive, and I think this is something that will remain in future legal texts, it will uh, need to be a state which makes a request to another state, France. So the initial uh, request needs to come from a community, but it needs to be transmitted by a state. And this is the position that the Senate adopted with respect to the Maori heads that were restituted. If the Maori community themselves uh, uh, to ask France for it. This request wouldn't have been able to be uh, accepted. But uh, uh, in New Zealand, uh, the uh, New Zealand government then uh, uh, asked the Maori com community to, 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 re to represent it once the items had been uh, restituted. So obviously this question of ownership and its different forms do differ from one place to another. We are uh, shaped by Roman law, but it doesn't always give the same uh, results. Uh, there are similarities, for example, between Belgian and French uh, systems, uh, fewer similarities with Germany actually. So even within a fairly small uh, geographic area, we don't necessarily have the same legal systems and concepts. So uh, it is clear that the systems in which the idea of ownership is uh, conceived of and understood uh, 
uh, on the part of those who are asking for us to restitute and return objects, uh, uh, that needs to be taken into account in, in understanding the requests. But the law in France will not uh, resolve this issue. If there's a law, I don't know what exactly it will look like when it's voted, but it will uh, fit in with our national legal framework with some fairly strong fundamentals and the requests will need to deal with that. It's not going to be based on other people's legal frameworks. And, and Sophie, uh, if I could uh, uh, respond to this, thank you for this question. It's a very essential question. Uh, in the uh, draft bill, there was scope for individuals or groups to request the restitution of an, a, a document if they had uh, official support from their state. But when we started thinking about this issue, uh, we realized that it's uh, very difficult to say that I'm going to discuss an uh, uh, object only with this uh, uh, community, only this is. Uh, uh, individual and uh, I will deny the state structure in that country and I'm going to do, uh, negotiate only with the individuals. That seemed to us to be a bit uh, neo-colonial. So in our law, it is uh, with uh, the state that we will be negotiating. And this notion of negotiating with communities and individuals so this has disappeared. So we'll have very state to state relationships, which may be an unfortunate thing. And that uh, might uh, lead to us ignoring some of the concerns of specific communities. To take into account the second part of your uh, question, how is it uh, possible to take into account uh, different views of ownership in different communities? In terms of thinking about provenance, it's difficult to say that we took a, an object uh, that was a property of a person or a village. It's difficult to say that because the, the idea of ownership is different. So we'll need to take into account these ideas uh, in studying the provenance of different objects and in the bilateral agreements. And perhaps uh, when we think about human remains and archives, when we can move beyond the state to state framework, we might use transitional justice frameworks where we could work with families, groups or communities that might uh, lead to other forms of restitution, which would take into account other people's points of views. Uh, so there would need to be a certain framework. The law doesn't necessarily uh, require the negation of other people's points of view, of course. I think we're going to stop there. I'm really sorry uh, because I realize there are lots of questions, but you're very welcome to come and uh, meet with our speakers as you enjoy a sandwich in the room uh, next door. Uh, this highlights the fact that this is a very broad subject, which we can continue to talk about. Thank you very much for the discussions. Thank you for your help. Uh, thank you for the interpreters and the, the, the technical sound support. Uh, we had a few small difficulties, but we did manage to resolve them. We're going to be back here at 2 p.m. French time. We're going to have a, a video with our colleague, Luis Raposo, who was my predecessor with ICOM Europe. He's now on the board of trustees of ICOM in National. He's from Portugal. It will be very interesting. Then we're going to have a roundtable discussion with Vincent Negri. Thank you very much and see you soon.